I'd like to call to order the November 18th meeting of our Clearwater City Council. This is our work. Generation of employees who served the city for a total of 80 years, uh, starting with 20 year employee Elliot Schoberg from the engineering department. Elliot Schoberg started with the city in November 1999 as an engineering specialist. He quickly obtained his professional engineering license and was promoted to stormwater manager in 2006. Elliot managed the stormwater department and utility fee until July of this year, 2019, when he was promoted to assistant director of the engineering department. During his 13 years as a stormwater manager, Elliott acquired more than $20 million in grant funding for capital improvement projects, worked with existing cash flow to eliminate bonding, and reduced the 2020 stormwater utility rate to the 2014 amount. Elliott was the lead on integrating the 42 FTE stormwater maintenance division, uh, uh, integrating that division into the engineering department in 2014, while also managing the land development group who performed building permit reviews. Elliott successfully managed the design and construction of many high-profile projects throughout the city, including Glen Oaks Park, Lake Bellevue Improvements, Cape Hawk Park, Hillcrest Bypass, which removes 36 homes from the floodplain, and currently Cleveland Streetscape Phase 3. Elliott is a native resident of Pinellas County, son of two school teachers. He attended SPC and graduated from USF with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Elliot worked for the Southwest Florida Water Management District for four years before starting with the city. Elliot gives back to his profession by serving as Vice President of the Florida Stormwater Association. Like stormwater flowing down the street into our creeks and bay, Elliot has crossed boundaries and has been instrumental in finding solutions to site-related challenges for all city departments. Elliot's breadth and depth of knowledge, caring and friendly attitude, dedication, loyalty, strong leadership and management skills have demonstrated Elliot's value to the engineering department and the city of Clearwater. We truly appreciate Elliot Schoberg's 20 years of service and congratulate him on this milestone. Elliot Schoberg. My neighborhood appreciates what you've done. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. We had really bad Thank you, sir. I want to apologize to the ladies who are in this group. I thought I was doing this in reverse alphabetical order. Find out I'm not even doing it in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to change it. Gina Clayton, 20, 20 years old. <laughs> In 1999, Gina Clayton started working for the city of Clearwater as a senior planner in the planning department. In July of 2001, Gina was promoted to the position of long-range planning manager. She served with distinction in that capacity until April 2005 when she was promoted to the assistant director of planning, where she became known simply as A.D. Clayton. <laughs> as, an as an invaluable assistant director, Gina facilitated a host of initiatives in training, customer service, organizational change, and policy formulation, including the development of a departmental operations handbook. She took on all of these challenges and still ran the day-to-day -day management of staff and the management team. 2009, Gina was instrumental in facilitating the reorganization of planning and development and neighborhood services department into a single planning and development department. In this role, she was an invaluable resource in helping to build a cohesive and shared departmental culture of customer service and management support to the talented team that makes up planning and development. Gina is the consummate example of dedicated public service, integrity, commitment, and competency. It is of no surprise that after 20 years of dedicated service to the citizens of Clearwater, 
She was promoted in July of this year to the Director of Planning and Development. Congratulations, Gina, on your 20 years of exceptional public service. Thank you. Also for 20 years, Gina's cousin, Sandy Clayton. <laughs> Sandy Clayton started her career in our Parks and Recreation Department as a Recreation Coordinator on November 22, 1999. As a recreation coordinator, she oversaw operations at multiple recreation centers on the east side of Clearwater, including Countryside, Morningside, Jasmine Courts, Wood Valley, Joe DiMaggio, and the Long Center. Additionally, she managed summer camp planning for the entire city, along with athletics and our wellness programs. Sandy was then promoted to a recreation manager on July 22, 2017. As the recreation manager, she currently oversees administrative duties for all six of our recreation centers, Clearwater Beach, Countryside, Long Center, North Greenwood, Ross Norton, and Morningside, along with the Beach Lifeguard Operation, Community and Employee Wellness, and managing the JWB, charting the course for youth grant. During Sandy's tenure, she was instrumental in creating a citywide community wellness program called Healthy Choices for a Healthy Clearwater. This program was originally designed to make healthier choices uh, easier for city residents and employees by developing partnerships with local businesses. This program became so popular she applied and received a grant from the Pinellas County Health Department so that her efforts could be supported and eventually expanded to the program we are familiar with today. Professional development has always been important to Sandy as well. Sandy completed the master's degree in public administration from USF in 2007 the FRPA Joe Abrams Academy in 2010, and the NRPA Director School in 2017. Sandy has also served on several local and state boards for FRPA and currently chairs a committee that designs an annual training for all summer camp staff throughout the county. In Sandy's free time, she loves being a baseball mom to her son Matt by keeping score, working in the concession stand, and at the end of each weekend, trying to wash red clay out of white pants. <laughs> Sandy, thank you for your 20 years of service. Congratulations. Sandy, thank you very much. I was asked if, if Sandy and Gina truly are cousins. I said, no, they're actually twin sisters. <laughs> and I the truth of the matter is, they are not related. <laughs> Just in case somebody, you know. We have maybe rules on that. Right. Thing, yeah. Actually, we, we don't. Don't? Well, no. oh, okay. Yeah. You can come back to work in two years. Yeah. In two years. <laughs> uh, who's left? Oh. Donnie Packer from Clearwater Gas. <laughs> Donnie, not that Elliot isn't a gentleman, but I knew that you would agree that the ladies should go first, and I apologize that I didn't, no I didn't realize that you know <laughs> the ladies were last on the list. So. Gotcha. Donnie Packer began his career at the city of Clearwater with the public with public utilities in 1999 and then transferred to Clearwater Gas in June of 2004, beginning his career in distribution, but landed in our installation section. Donnie was promoted to installation supervisor in November 2011, where he played several major roles in the, in the success of our growing gas utility, especially our installation team during both the lean and busy periods. As supervisor of installation, a portion of Donnie's responsibility included daily communications with sales staff, gathering required paperwork, and various last-minute details for every job sold to a customer. 
Donnie heavily utilized his years of field knowledge and training in addition to his personality and humor to further develop relationships with the various permitting agencies as well as customers throughout this very time-consuming process. His vision to transform the installation team resulted in a revenue increase from $725,000 to over $1.5 million in just five years. This 48% increase in profit, along with improved communication, reestablished a sense of pride within the installation section. Finally, in August 2017, Donnie joined the, Gale, the gas sales team, where he utilizes his innate ability to fix anything when existing homeowners are requesting gas service. For the past two years, Donnie has been a great asset as a sale, gas sales representative. In just these 24 months, Donnie has signed up 259 new gas customers, which has resulted in selling over $500,000 in appliance sales. Donnie's down-to-earth attitude, coupled with his keen ability to resolve issues with any job, completely leaves the customer at ease during the entire process. Not only was Donnie recognized as the Clearwater Gas Employee of the Year in 2012, he later was named the coveted Florida National Gas Association's Operations Person of the Year in 2017. Help me thank and wish Donnie Packer 20 years of dedicated service to the city. David Stoner from our library department has been with the city for 25 years, but David is out ill today, so he is not going to be joining us. Uh, also want to recognize our Employee of the Month for October 2019, Adam Chavez from our police department. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's not here either, right? Okay. We will recess our work session and call to order our community develop redevelopment agency meeting for november the 18th are there any addition or corrections to the minutes of october the 14th will they be approved second motion has been made and seconded to approve the minutes of october the 14th all in favor say aye, aye. aye. opposed no Motion carries unanimously. Anybody from the public wishing to speak to an item that is not on the agenda of the CRA? If so, please come forward at this time. Please fill out a card, and you would have three minutes to speak after you identify yourself. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am Bill Johnson, and I have to address the subject of Mr. Dowk's Imagine Clearwater update that happened at the work session on November 4th. I'm pleased that there will be public discussion meetings in early December to see the results of the 30% plans. This is really the first choice, chance for the public to provide comments on the Imagine Clearwater details. I think there needs to be a big effort prior to those public meetings to document how the design will implement the whys instead of just the whats of Imagine Clearwater. The engineers are great at designing functional structures, but if those structures aren't aligned with the goals of Imagine Clearwater, you will have missed the goals of downtown vitality and park vitality. The city spent $378,000 to HRNA to develop a citizen's conceptual plan for IMAGINE. Not a plan for the council, not a plan for Scientology, not a plan for the chamber, not a plan for downtown, and not a plan for Ruth Eckert, but a citizen's wide, citywide plan. And that was approved by referendum by 75% of the public. The public loved the plan in November 2017. That was two years ago. Last April, I spoke to you at one of your council meetings about the unknown options of the waterfront. The HRNA report on page 47 
said the waterfront should comprise of a series of distinct experiences unique to Clearwater. Will Mr. Delk's presentations in December provide this answer? Let's remember the conceptual vision, which is on the, on the screen. Downtown Clearwater waterfront will be an active, authentic, iconic civic and open space that celebrates Clearwater's history, natural beauty, culture, diversity, and anchors an economically vibrant downtown. The 30% design meetings should be about the feelings and the experiences to implement that vision. How will the preliminary design deliver those feelings and experience? Please answer those questions before you start spending money on the project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the Is board. anybody else from the public wishing to speak to an item that is not on the agenda of the CRA? If not, I will close public comment and move on to agenda item 4.1. Yes, approve a two-year contract with Spark Zoo LLC for $71,200 for the maintenance of the Community Redevelopment Agency website during 2020 and 2021 and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. So this item, uh, Spark Zoo is our current um, website host and maintainer. We also have special project hours with them to add new features to the website like 360 video and this is uh, to do a two-year extension of that contract with an additional um, 200 hours to be used for special projects any questions of staff on agenda item 4.1 mr. Hamilton how does this how does this price compare to the contract we've been operating under presently this is slightly higher if you if you look in there there's a different there's basic basic plus and advanced and we've been operating under basic plus and so we're moving to advanced okay. which reflects if you remember the last session we had where we were talking about all the social media and video and on uh, right okay. Thank you. any other questions uh, explain the cost concerns me up for the 200 hours if you know, if you divide 200 into the 71,200 you get like a hundred and you know over over two years I assume that means 400 hours or is it 200 hours for so two years? I could I could see how the summer could be a little confusing the 71,200 is for all the services the hosting the maintenance ADA upgrades it's not for the project hours um, the project hours are an exact number Rosemary, do you know the exact project You can just tell me. It says $105 an hour fee. Like what's the cost per hour? It's $177 per hour. Right. But but that's not, we're not just getting 200 hours of, of service. That, that, that's what I want to have clarified. That is correct. This is not just for 200 hours of service. This is for many, many more hours okay. and all the hosting and maintenance. Okay. Any other questions, Council? Anybody from the public to speak to agenda item 4.1? Motion Move approval of agenda item 4.1. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve agenda item 4.1. Comments, council. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Agenda item 4.2. Yes, approved transfer of funds from 3887552-94714 Downtown Redevelopment Project Fund in the amount of $30,000 to 388-7552-94862 CarPro Project Fund. And this is a, the site at um, 1359 Cleveland Street that's in its seventh year of post-monitoring of the groundwater. So this is an environmental remediation project. And we are fortunate that our engineering staff um, watches this and uh, they pull together the quotes to continue this monitoring so that we can continue to clean the property. So we're looking to transfer $30,000 to cover that monitoring. And remediation. Any questions of staff on 4.2? Mr. Poglice. This is one of the sites that went out for RFP, correct? It is not. This is it the is one not. that's close to the um, saloon spur. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. In downtown Gateway. Got it. Anybody from the public speak to agenda item 4.2? Motion. Motion to approve agenda item 4.2. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve agenda item 4.2. Comments, Council? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Agenda item 
Authorize the CRA Executive Director to terminate negotiations with HopDaddy LLC and close RFP 09-19 for the development and sale of 115 South Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and the adjoining vacant lot. Um, so on July 15th, um, you all authorized me to prepare an agreement uh, with terms that you had adopted for development and sale of 115 South Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Unfortunately, we could not reach a final agreement on the development terms. Um, one of the predominant examples was that the um, Hop Daddy wanted to be able to use it for whatever use downtown zoning allowed. So if a microbrewery wasn't working out in five years, they wanted automatic approval to have a nightclub or some diff any different type of use allowed by downtown zoning, um, which was not acceptable uh, to the CRA, those, that kind of agreement. So um, the city attorney has recommended that we officially terminate negotiations just so the record's very clear. Any questions of staff on agenda item 4.3? Anybody from the public speak to agenda item 4.3? Move approval of agenda item 4.3. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve agenda item 4.3. Comments, Council? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Do you have any other business for the CRA, Ms. Thompson? I do. I have a, a couple of announcements, um, announcements and updates. Um, the first is uh, Eleanor Lydia, uh, who is a downtown advocate, uh, longtime downtown advocate and participant, and Janelle Branch, um, who works for The Ring, and uh, Lena Tasheda all came together with an idea that they have presented now at the Merchants Association to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, now called Amplify, and to the Downtown Development Board and received their approval and would like to work with the CRA to put um, 3D projected lights down the center of Cleveland. And Councilmember Albritton and Polgley saw the presentation, so I just wanted to let you guys know that we're going to start researching the cost of options from low-level lighting under the trees to string lights to the trees to this 3D mapping moving projection on the trees. And the idea being that this is going to be something that's interactive, something that's always changing, and will really light up Cleveland Street. So it'll be an attraction in and of itself. So I wanted to let you guys know that the downtown community has come together to support that idea, and we're happy to research that and see um, what we can do with that. I also wanted to introduce today, we have our new CRA Business Assistance Administrator, um, Howard Smith. You would wave, Howard? Um, he comes to us from the Home Builders Institute and has a wide range of experience um, helping, hasn't worked in construction directly, but tangentially in development and construction and programs to help people get into that field, um, run a lot of programs across multiple states. So I'm excited to bring his um, you know, design and implementation skills to our team. He will be focused in this his first 90 days on meeting every single um, business owner in the CRA and determining what kind of programs they need to be more successful. One thing that's top of mind for me is we're going to be under construction for probably two years between Imagine Clearwater and Streetscape Phase 3. Um, that it's a good thing, but it's also a very painful period of time for businesses when you're under construction. And we want to be planning now and have plans in place to keep our businesses uh, vibrant during that time. Uh, the Clearwater Arts Alliance and the Downtown Development Board came together very successfully, I think, for a short film contest that the CRA helped with about downtown. So we had five submissions from um, different residents and, and visitors. They made their own one-minute film about downtown. Those are all at downtownclearwater.com if you want to view them. Really, really good. Um, the, the top awardee is actually a former professional um, actress and dancer on Broadway. So that was exciting. She lives right here in Clearwater and put her talents to work here. And we also had um, our youngest entrant was 18 or 19 um, that gave their version of downtown, but all very beautiful, very positive. So we'll be promoting those on social media. Since we've done our mural program, since our last one came up a little short of a year ago, we've had private property owners put up three new murals on their own. So I want to give a big thank you to La Hispania to Gulf Coast European Automotive and to Wax and Willys. That's the latest one on Gulf to Bay that you might have seen. Um, so this was no CRA funds, right? These property owners were inspired by our project and decided to beautify their own properties, and we are very appreciative of that. 
Last two announcements. Right now we are hosting Urban Conga in Second Century Studios. If you haven't been down there yet to do their interactive wall showing you how you can incorporate play into the city, it, it is fun. Um, it's, it's worth your afternoon. And this is part of our initiatives to make downtown more welcoming and more connected, right? To be able, like the other placemaking tools you've seen, painting the murals, the storm drains, I mean, um, this is a way that people can be actively involved in building the kind of city that they want to live in. And it is the holiday season, believe it or not. It's starting. So Holiday Extravaganza is back for the second year. We're going to have interactive light displays, movies in Station Square. Merchants will be decorating their windows. And you can find out more at downtownclearwater.com. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Any other comments, council or trustees? We will adjourn the CRA and reconvene our work session of November the 18th, agenda item 3.1. Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mayor. Approve a three-year Clearwater Beach route funding agreement between Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, PSTA, and the city for an amount equal to actual revenue hours multiplied by 25% of the rate bill to PSTA by Jolly Trolley along the Clearwater Beach route and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. So, uh, Mr. Hellios. Yep. Uh, Jim Hellios, Assistant to the City Manager. The item that we have before you is uh, funding of a three-year agreement between uh, PSTA, the Jolly Trolley, and the City of Clearwater to provide uh, Jolly Trolley access throughout downtown and uh, to the beach. What we have done is uh, we looked at a new funding formula. We um, previously had used funding based off of uh, what we call a fair box recovery. Um, unfortunately for us to provide a recommendation to you, we wanted to make sure that we had a, a concrete estimate on the um, amount of hours and the amount of costs. The fair box recovery can be commingled with um, other passes. So we don't have a, a good correlation of what's used um, by riders in our system versus countywide riders. So if someone has a countywide pass, they can uh, utilize the fare box, but those hours, there's no way for us to track that. So when we came to you, we wanted to make sure that we had a, we could track the flat amount of hours being utilized on that route, and then we worked with um, PSTA to come up with a funding formula that would allow us to take a percentage of those hours and multiply it by um, a percentage cost and then multiply it by those hours, which would be split amongst PSTA. Now, this does not include this spring break um, program. That's going to come to you at a later date. This just allows us to come to you with the uh, current agreement that we have and uh, basically modified. It had been, uh, uh, we had gone on the same formula for about three years, and we felt that this would provide us more stability and also provides an impetus for PSTA to increase ridership. Because based on this formula, the more riders they have, that's the more revenue they're going to they're going to take in. Where under the other formula, revenue was split down the middle of the fare box. So we figured that this was also another uh, benefit to PSTA. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we have Cassandra Butchers from uh, PSTA. She could also answer any questions. Mr. Albert. So I understand that this rate, 25%, is less than the 2017 rate or 28. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's it's very hard to compare the two. It's it's a it's just a totally different system. The other one would have been equitable to about 28 to 29 percent, I believe, so a little higher. The previous rate, if you if you tried to match them up to the to the new formula, but the old formula was totally different. And we felt this formula also provided us more cost certainty because, again, when you're taking the the fare box formula, that can fluctuate. Uh, you know, you could also have the opportunity of uh, having a lesser rate. But if the fare box recovery is not high enough, then our contribution could also escalate. So this provides us cost certainty, and that was one thing we wanted to bring forward to you. There might be, uh, and what we did is how we came up with this number is we went back over uh, a number of years and looked at our percentage of funding based on the fare box recovery. And as uh, Assistant City Manager Maxwell said, it was it was pretty much on that 25 to 28 range within there. So that's how we came to the number with PSTA. Um, is that, you know, based on historical averages, this is what it could be. Again, when you take the fare box, there's a possibility the percentage could be lower or also higher, but we lose the cost certainty. And again, as we know, the markets can be volatile, and there's no way to sit there and pinpoint exactly what it would be. But under this scenario, we can budget appropriately for it because we have a uh, cost certain average. Mr. Pugliese. Thank you, Mayor. So I'm going to kind of like 
break this down really simplified for myself. So the Jolly Trolley bills PSTA X amount and then 25% more is what we're going to pay. So turn the clock back several years, we would just be contracting and paying Jolly Trolley a straight amount for the same service. So, but because PSTA is running the whole service now, it's rate billed by Jolly Trolley to PSTA plus 25%. No, actually how it's billed, uh, Councilman Polkleys, is what it is, is we pay 25% of the overall rate. Uh, plus there's, uh, so there's an hourly rate that Jolly Trolley uh, and PSTA agree to. I believe it's uh, $87 an hour. So then we'll take it by the number of hours that um, are tracked based on our routes, I think 14,000 hours. So we'll take that 14,000 number and we multiply it by that $80 an hour and we pay 25% of that and then PSTA pays the remainder of that. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? So, bottom line, is this going to cost us more money or less money? It will under this current this current year scenario. It is um, will be almost the same. I would say maybe a couple thousand dollars less. Um, now, further years down the road, depending on uh, the now, and we also Council has the number. You could put a cap on the number of hours that that we. Um, agree to pay to so that will provide us uh, cost certainty but it's going to the average is going to be around the same there could be you know maybe a two or three percent increase either way but again it's the cost certainty factor where if we went with that fare box it could be 20 percent higher it also could be 20 percent lower but we didn't want to ex put that type of exposure um, to the city we wanted to make sure we had cost certainty that we could within two to three percent base it on uh, our budgeted figures <laughs> And, and what, why are we doing this on a three? Why, why don't we do it for a one year or a two year? I, I mean, three years is. And that's based on the agreement that PSTA currently has with Jolly Trolley and their other partners throughout the system. So whether it be the uh, like the Suncoast Beach Trolley, um, and that runs you know down into Madeira Beach in that area and up through Dunedin, those contracts are all based on a three year agreement, and also with the county's funding um, of. PSTA and the Jolly Trolley Service, that is also based on a three-year agreement. So uh, it was decided that to be concurrent with what the county's offering and the other municipalities are in on, then it would three-year agreement is what's uh, standard amongst all operators. And these other municipalities are using the same formula then now? Yeah, well, actually, um, the formula that's set up is our, our, benef our formula is structured um, uh, more to our benefit because of the, the the cost um, escalation that's factored in, there's a 3% cost escal ex escalation that's factored in with our contract, The other, and that's the direct cost that um, PSTA pays to the Jolly Trolley. The other municipalities have a 5% cost es escalation. Just, and you know, due to our volume and the amount of service we did, uh, PSTA was willing to negotiate that with us for us to pay uh, essentially the same direct cost that they're paying to the Jolly Trolley without that extra 2% administrative fee that um, is, is tagged onto the other agreements. And Mayor, not to jump in, uh, Mr. Harris, but what's in Section 3 of the agreement? Identify yourself, please. I'm sorry. Identify. Oh, I'm sorry. Michael Foligno, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, in Section 3 of the agreement, it says that if the city determines that there's not sufficient budgeted funds to go forward with the agreement, then we can terminate without any further cost. So essentially, it's three one-year agreements to the extent that we can have sufficient budget to cost. Okay. Mayor, I just want to clarify, Mr. as far Max, as the, the, um, the hours are concerned and the cost, we have two options in here. One was based on uh, the original agreement and the route related to the original agreement, which did not include the, uh, the, the downtown or the transfer, the beach transfer. Um, when that was added, uh, TSTA ate those hours, so basically we did. We were not paying for that additional service from the beach to downtown, including that in the whole in the whole route. We were on the original the original service. So this has two options. One is to go back to the original service, something closer to that, which is I believe nine thousand six hundred and seventeen estimated hours. Uh, the other is to continue with the service that's ongoing, which is the. Uh, 14,136 hours. Uh, so uh, the, the option two, the, the one with the 9,617 hours, that, that dollar amount associated with our formula 
is basically the same we're paying right now. The 14,000 hour version, we are paying more for additional service. And I can speak to uh, the additional service that Mr. Maxwell speaks about. That is being able to provide direct uh, service from the beach to downtown. Well, on the 9,000 hours, what we're looking at is there'd be a transfer based off of, um, I believe, the setup now, Rick, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it is at the uh, Clearwater Marine Aquarium or the, um, the, the bus out loop. So what'll happen is that in order to get direct access to downtown for beach goers and, and vice versa, they will need to transfer um, at that particular location where the enhanced service um, would allow direct access um, downtown. Rick, you must be um, Yes, the downtown service began early in 2018, so that's what we're used to. That's the service that we've been receiving, and that resulted in the additional hours going from not, um, over slightly over 9,000 to 14,000. Um, that seems to be the service um, we want to continue. That is option one, but we've also provided you with the route map of option two, which was the previous service that terminated at Island Estates and then went back out to the beach. Consent? Uh, Mr. Condo. If I may, thank you. Um, is this going to be $285,000 per year for three years? It's a three year agreement. Uh, and yes, I that's correct. That's the annual cost for uh, this, uh, this agreement that's currently set up as. Yeah, I think, I believe, Mayor, uh, if I may, there, there is also um, in the appropriation code uh, that is based on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jim. Um, on the lower amount, the 195,000. If we were to do the higher amount, we will have to do a budget amendment to add those additional funds to uh, uh, either from the parking system or, which is how it's funded now, or from another source to the uh, to the contract. We have not allocated the, that additional hundred thousand dollars in the in the current budget. We need to come back with an appropriation for that. Wait, wait that, that, that just confused me, Mr. Maxwell. When I asked earlier the cost, we said it was the cost was going to be about the same, and now you're saying we're going to have to add 100000 So add, that means that the cost isn't the same. If you, if you, add, the hours, if you add additional hours, the additional hours which, which DSCA has been has been, uh, been eating themselves, if you add those in there, it is a higher cost from a comparable standpoint from the same system that we've been working on uh, from an hour's perspective to, to the new one, it's about the same. But when you add the additional hours, uh, it, will, it will rise. It will rise by about well, it, 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 You know, the question was, is this contract going to be the same cost? The answer was yes. And now you're saying no, it's going to cost us $100,000 more. If you want the direct route downtown, well, but but that, but that but that was their recommendation to go with the expanded service. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I apologize for that, Mayor. I I misspoke on that. It should have been if we wanted to maintain the exact same service, then with the enhanced amount of hours, because as Mr. Maxwell said, that amount uh, that service we've provided, but PSTA uh, they basically subsidize that amount of service. So if we want to go with what we're paying for now, we can go to option uh the second option which does not um give direct access to downtown the enhanced service would uh, cost more so i apologize that i misspoke well what are we getting for the enhanced service and how many more riders are we getting for that hundred thousand dollars rick do you want to speak to that the number? Sandra, do you want to one thing we're going to go to downtown yeah um I'll talk to the ridership numbers. I just want to point out, though, um, what what option one has allowed is to connect down uh, the beach more clearly and the city south of us directly to the downtown area. So that is one of the things that we had moved forward with approximately, you know, two years ago to be able to get people from the beach more efficiently to the downtown area and from downtown to the beach. As you can see, the, the previous option was terminating at the Publix. Um, so, 
and then this is the option that's been in existence for approximately a little less than two years that PSTA has been absorbing those costs. One of the things to keep in mind when we got into these uh, negotiations and looking at ridership, it had previously been based on these different revenue generators, and there are many, many different generators. <coughs> what type of card, what type of pass, what kind of discount, all those things tend to fluctuate, and so we would never get a, a good sense of what we we're paying for. So that's why we're proposing going to a <coughs> contract based on service hours strictly um, to remove that kind of you know, indecision and flex or fluctuation in the cost to the city. So, so we, we, we've had two years and so the question now is that two years, how many more riders have we gotten on this expanded service to downtown? Well, and I, is it worth the 100,000? I'm not aware of the baseline at that time of what the ridership numbers were. That's why I'm asking this board just to address <coughs> that question. Okay. Morning, Council. Cassandra Borchers, Chief Development Officer at PSTA. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, I, I, before I answer that question, which I will, I do have an answer, um, I want to tell you um, how great your staff has been to work with. Um, they really have dug into the numbers. None of the staff that um, were involved in the uh, discussion this year have been involved in the past. And so they really took a fresh look at the numbers and at the formula that they're recommending today. In February of 2018, um, as Mr. Hartman mentioned, we expanded the service uh, to from Island Estates into downtown Clearwater. So previous to February of 2018, the Jolly Trolley South Beach route connected Sand Key to Island Estates and did not come into downtown. Um, I think with the all of the work that you're doing in uh, in downtown with Imagine Clearwater, um, it became very clear to us and to you all that the connection from the beach to downtown was critical to advancing downtown um, and making sure that people could en enjoy both the beach and downtown. At that time, uh, PSTA did not pass on those costs to the city at all. So we were operating under an agreement that included a 50-50 split of the service cost after the fare box recovery. Over time, the fare box recovery system-wide has changed, um, and we've seen a de decrease in fare box recovery, while on this route, and particularly the South Beach route, we have seen an increase in ridership. And so people are traveling more people at a lower cost, which is exa exactly what PSTA strives to do. So the increase in ridership between February of 2018 and today has been about 40,000 rides a year. So as an annualized number, we are getting much more ridership from that connection into downtown, understanding that we do have other services that do come to downtown. But right now, the service that we are operating today, including all routes, is about five trips a day from the beach into downtown. I did feeling. answer the question, but I got a lot of other stuff in. No, we, we, we appreciate that, and we appreciate being able to work with PSTA and the Jolly Trolley. Uh, you know, transportation is so vital to all of us, but and I think we understand that there is a subsidy that has to be paid, but we need to at least have some clarification. Absolutely, as to the, um, the cost to the city last year for fiscal year 19, as Mr. Maxwell said, included only the service hours to Island Estates. Um, and we thought that was fair for a second year because it takes about two years to build, to build ridership. Um, and so that was just a slight increase, and I believe that contract cost was $220,000. So um, we are looking at an increase um, from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20. However, that is the true cost of the service, and it is a reduction in the cost per hour that the city would be paying. Um, as Mr. Maxwell mentioned, historically, the contribution from the city 
prior to February of 2018 has been about 28% of the total cost of service. And that fluctuated year to year. You've seen me here before talk about the change in the fare box recovery and how that affects our formula. In talking to staff and them wanting a more stable formula, the 25% of the total cost um, as a formula is a cost reduction overall. However, because of the change in hours, um, as Mr. Halios mentioned, um, there will be an increase in cost in total. Uh, if, if the ridership doesn't stay at the same level, if there's a decrease in ridership, as opposed to staying at the same level or increase, uh, would it be possible for us to come back and revisit the contract that's for three years after the first year? Well, you can always revisit the contract, right? I mean, well, I, there is that provision, and you do have control within your budget process to decide if you want to budget that as a line item. Um, I would say that would change the formula again. And PSTA is committed to making sure that we put the marketing and communications dollars into this route to ensure that it, it is successful. And I will tell you that it is one of the most successful uh, routes within our entire system in the county. That's a good ending right there. Cons consent, council? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 4.1. Four Approve the renewal of an agreement with Commercial Risk Management, Inc. of Tampa, Florida, for the management and administration of workers' comp compensation claims from February 1, 2020 through January 31, 2021, pursuant to the Clearwater Code of Ordinances service, uh, sections, services associated with workers' compensation exempt from bidding for a not-to-exceed total of $25,000 and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. Mr. Rosario. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Good morning. Rick Osorio, Risk Manager. The Risk Management Division of the Finance Department has a current agreement approved uh, in February 2019 by Council, uh, City Council expiring January 31st, 2020 with Commercial Risk Management, which, who is a third-party administrator for workers' compensation claims. The services would be needed if we received an overload of complicated medical claims or st city claim staff issues arose. Uh, the requested renewal retains the same fee structure as a current agreement. An annual administrative fee of $2,500 has been added to provide consulting services on pending claims, which will greatly benefit the city administration of our claims. The third annual term of this agreement will commence February 1st, 2021 and we'll have one additional renewal term option to be documented in writing by both parties. The retention of commercial risk management to administer and manage our more complex and litigated claims will provide risk management and the city greater effectiveness in the investigative and physical management of our workers' compensation claims and program when needed. We project a potential of 20 to 25 claims annually being referred to them for their services. Uh, the risk management division is respectfully requesting approval of this agreement with commercial risk management. Any questions of staff on agenda item 4.1? Consent? Yes. Agenda item 4.2. Approve a two year renewal of Corvell Healthcare Cooperation's agreement for the review of workers' compensation medical bills and pharmacy benefit management services in the not to exceed amount of $170,000 or term January 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2021, pursuant to Clearwater Code of Ordinances section, services associated with workers' compensation exempt from bidding and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. Mr. Rosario, again. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Uh, Council previously approved the current pricing agreement with Corvell for the period of January 1st through December 31st, 2019, with an not to exceed amount of $120,000. For the renewal beginning next year, Corvell has proposed a two-year amendment to the original agreement, which will increase the bill review service, free, service fee from $6.90 per bill to $7.11 per bill through December 31, 2020, and $7.32 uh, per invoice through December 31, 2021. All other rates will remain the same. This is a final renewal allowed under the council-approved agreement that was initially effective January 1st, 2017, 
through the end of 2017. Staff is requesting a not to exceed amount of $170,000 for the two year period of January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2021. The new proposed rate structure will result in an estimated 1% increase in total costs over the previous year. Uh, the risk management division is respectfully requesting approval of this agreement with Corvell Healthcare. Questions of staff on 4.2, Mr. Pogleis. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Sir, I want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, yes, the item right before that, and I let it go because I, nobody else caught it. You said 2,500. It's 25,000, and, and this item here, 4.2. You said 120,000, and our paperwork shows 170,000. Yeah, we're asking for 170,000 for the two-year period uh, with Corvell. The 2,500 you referred to before was um, the uh, consulting fee that's been added to that to the agreement. administrative. Okay. Yes, sir. I got it. So the total is the same. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Sure. Any other questions, Council? No, thank you. Consent. Yes. 4.3. Authorize the issuance of not to exceed $30 million of City of Clearwater, Florida, non ad valorem revenue bond, series 2020. Imagine Clearwater and adopt resolution 19-34. Mr. Barriker. I'm Barriker, Finance Department. Uh, this resolution authorizes the issuance of not to exceed $30 million of uh, tax exempt City of Clearwater, Florida, non ad valorem uh, revenue uh, bonds. Uh, to partially fund uh, Magin Clearwater Project. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for staff on 4.3? Uh, we'll talk about Mr. it. We'll Mr. talk about it on um, Thursday. But uh, I think this is, at number one, this is not to exceed, exceed number because my understanding presently uh, we're looking at possibly around $15 million in un unidentified funding right now. Is that correct? I think it's uh, with the uh, April, you added in the uh, covered seating in the back of house. So I think that, that pushed us to around $14 million, uh, somewhere in that range. Right. I think minus that, it was one to two million. Okay. And the other, the other part to be understood is this is non ad valorem tax. That means we're not taking just, we can't, we will not be taking property taxes and raising them to pay this bond. That will not be a, a function, correct? That is correct. Jay Ravens, finance director. Um, you could be indirectly because this is a covenant to budget non ad valorem tax dollars, mm -hmm. which also fund general fund. So to the extent that those other to the extent that we draw on those other non ad valorem, um, there is an impact potentially down the road as any general fund expenditure could lead to increased property taxes down the road. There, there's always, it's, it's, a simple, it's a simple matter of revenues and expenditures and this is an additional expenditure to the general fund. The general fund would be paying the debt service on these non ad valorem bonds. We're just not covenant we're not we're not making a pledge of ad valorem dollars we're instead making a covenant to budget non ad valorem but we can't say that this couldn't potentially lead to a millage increase indirectly down the road okay. it, it, explain what you mean by non ad valorem dollars those are other general fund revenue sources such as utility taxes franchise fees um, the other revenue categories within the general fund that we basically have to have adequate revenue from those sources to cover the debt service for these bonds. But, but, but just again to clarify, because I, I don't want people to, you know, falling up on, on Mr. Hamilton's point, yeah. the, the non ad valorem tax dollars that we receive for general revenue they pay a majority of our general expenditures and not property tax dollars. That is correct. So if we're using some of those dollars to pay back these bonds, then that leaves us less money for general revenue expenditures. So we would either have to increase the taxes, the property taxes, or reduce our expenditures. Absolutely. Okay. That's correct. 
and do we get a better or, or uh, the interest rate on this type of a bond compared to a, 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 a secured bond? Or does um, it not? I don't think there's much of a difference. I, I think the real key to this type of a bond is the flexibility that affords us versus pledging a particular revenue okay. in our general fund. Um, we have more flexibility in how we budget and appropriate. And if, if a particular revenue is suffering because of legislative changes or because of the economy, um, we're not dependent on that revenue to, to satisfy our bond requirements. We, we are able to be more flexible through our budget process to determine how we pay for our debt service. Mr. Maxwell? I just wanted to clarify something for Councilmember Hamilton. Um, so the, the original funding strategy that was, was put together was uh, totaled at around $49 million. Uh, that included $25,500,000 in, in bond, in bond <coughs> we, are, we, we remain uh, $15 million short from that number. So the, this bond wouldn't necessarily cover that, uh, cover that extra amount. I just want to make sure that's right. This will be on our, unless there are any other questions, this will be on our agenda Thursday night. <clears throat> agenda item 5.1. Bill A's update, Mr. Dunbar. Uh, good morning, Kevin Dunbar, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, just, you know, got a quarterly update uh, for Council on where we're at with the status of the, um, the Spectrum Field and the Carpenter Complex uh, projects. Um, Currently, uh, we have uh, pulled back on our, um, uh, our our discussions with the county, waiting to get uh, definitive numbers from the uh, the architect that's been hired to do Spectrum Field, the uh, Populous. Uh, we hope to have those within the next 30 days, if not a little bit sooner, and then we'll provide that to the county. Uh, we have another meeting coming up at the county, uh, the beginning of December, to talk about uh, to talk about that. Uh, county was concerned about um, the numbers that we had been providing them. Uh, they were uh, numbers from about a year and a half ago that were um, uh, concept numbers, and they were looking for more specifics in terms of the ask and the dollar amount. So we move forward there. Parallel to that, uh, the team is working on uh, developing the final piece for the items that will be provided as part of the marketing benefits. Uh, as well as the team is working on, there's some question as it relates to the Carpenter Complex and what may or may not be uh, TD, uh, TDT funds may be available um, to be utilized. Um, and uh, they are specific to MLB spring training use is what the county's told us. So we are working through uh, defining exactly how MLB spring training will be utilizing these new facilities uh, as it relates to the Carpenter Complex. In addition to that, we have been uh, touring various county staff as well as um, uh, some of the members currently with the intent of doing all of them from the BCC as well as the Parks and Recreation Board around the two facilities. Uh, not to tour the, the facilities, but to tour what the improvements will be, to see where the challenges are, to look where the improvements will be. So that's the update on the county. Uh, we are at about 50% for our agreements and we've been on hold as it relates to both uh, uh, construction, uh, spectrum, as well as the carpenter agreements. Uh, it's all contingent upon knowing that where we're at with the county. So we're ready to move forward there once we have that. And then once we have both of those in place, we'll be able to uh, submit our state application. Uh, we hope sometime early next year is when we're going to be able to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, in terms of the two facilities, uh, Carpenter construction April to uh, April to December, and Spectrum is um, September to January. So that th that kind of leaves us, you know, you know, every time we kind of miss a cycle, it puts us off another year. Uh, there are uh, just the final point to make is there's a couple of smaller projects or projects that we're going to be within this project that we are moving forward with, and the team is funding. Uh, those projects, and that is uh, some increased office space uh, at the um, at, at Spectrum Field uh, was done on the first floor. Uh, this spring, they'll be installing uh, additional safety netting. Um, 
not only to be compliant with Major League Baseball standards, but really to provide for the public safety of people in the stands. And then the final piece is a uh, hydration station at the Carpenter Complex. Uh, small items, but the team's funding it out of what their commitment would be. So would that be happy to answer any questions? I don't know, City Manager, did I leave anything out? Any questions on 5.1? Great, thanks. Right, thank you, sir. Okay. 6.1. Approve a six-year agreement with Reese Engineering uh, Inc. of Orlando, Florida, in the amount of four million one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for water and reclaim water program consultant services, and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. Mr. Brown. Uh, good morning. My name is Jeremy Brown, the engineering manager for utilities. This project includes assessment, evaluation, design. Uh, bidding and construction engineering inspection services for similar for substantially similar tasks that involve water and or reclaimed water all bundled into one project. With your approval, the Director of Public Utilities will be authorized to approve specific work orders to address the list of, ta the list of tasks associated with this project. I'd like to point out that this is only for engineering services. Construction contracts will still be brought to Council for your approval as required. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions on 6.1, Mr. Kondo? Uh, Four million is a lot of money. Um, I know it's spread over six years. Uh, what value do we get for, for that investment? Uh, well, we imagine it's going to be more efficient. The process will be more streamlined by having the same engineer working on the project. Any other questions? Consent? Yep. 6.2. Accept a sidewalk easement from the property owner for the installation, repair, and maintenance of a sidewalk on real property located at 380 South Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and adopt Resolution 19-36. Mr. Burzak. Robert Burzak, Real Estate Coordinator. The subject easement provides the public use of the sidewalk and the city property rights for maintenance, repair, and replacement of the sidewalk. Any questions? Any questions on 6.2? Okay, it will be on our agenda Thursday night. 6.3. Grant two perpetual easements to the Florida Department of Transportation for the purpose of constructing and maintaining a pedestrian overpass at Horn Boulevard and US 19 North. Authorize the appropriate officials to execute same and adopt resolution 19-39, Mr. President. The proposed easements will provide the FDOT property rights necessary to construct and maintain the pedestrian overpass at US 19 and Harm Boulevard. Any questions? Any questions on 6.3? Yes, Miss well, Mr. Hamilton. Um, the, I understand the, the, how is this, has this been designed or they still have to do the design? And is the ADA uh, requirements, are they gonna be addressed by a elevator or a uh, ramp? Well, they'll have a ramp. It's going to have a they'll ramp. The ramp and, and stairs and SA has been designed. It's not going to have an elevator. No. Okay, so we're not going to have to maintain an elevator. No. And, okay. And, uh, okay, that's good. Yeah. That answer. But we're not going to have to m maintain this at No, at it's going to be at FDOT. Yeah. Well, I was just concerned more about a safety issue of yeah. late night, middle night, yeah. you know, elevator. Um, creates it it's it's a lot more visible uh ramps and not an elevator okay so this will be on our agenda for thursday night thanks 7.1 approve the annexation initial future land use map designation of residential urban and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential district for 2048 the mall and pass the appropriate ordinances on first reading. Mr. Brother. Thank you, Kyle Brotherton, Planning and Development. This voluntary annexation petition involves one parcel of land totaling 0.114 acres and is currently occupied by a single family dwelling. The applicant is requesting annexation in order to receive sanitary sewer service and solid waste service uh, from the city. The applicant is aware that the sewer impact fee must be paid in full prior to connection and of the additional cost to extend city sewer service to the property. Any questions of staff on 7.1? This will be on our agenda Thursday night, 7.2. Approve the annexation, initial future land use map designation of residential low and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential district 
for 2765 Avocado Drive and pass the appropriate ordinances on first reading. Mr. Diego. Morning. Rivera, I'm sorry. Diego. Morning, Diego Guevara, Daniel and Deverna. This voluntary annexation petition involves one parcel of land totaling 0.20 acre occupied by a single family dwelling. The applicant is requesting the annexation in order to receive solid waste service from the city. The property is not contiguous to, is not contiguous to existing city limits. However, it is in an enclave surrounded by city property in all sides and is eligible for annexation pursuant the interlocal service boundary agreement with Pinellas County. Uh, it is proposed that the property be assigned a future land use map designation of residential low and a zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential. Any questions of staff on agenda item 7.2? This will go on our agenda Thursday night, 7.3. Approve the annexation, initial future land use map designation of residential low and initial zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential district 4, 1717 Grove Drive and pass the appropriate ordinances on first reading. Mr. Gorbachev again. This voluntary annexation petition involves one parcel of land totaling 0.18 acre occupied by a single family dwelling. The applicant is requesting the annexation in order to receive sanitary sewer service and solid waste service from the city. The property is located with an enclave and is contiguous to existing city boundaries in all sides. The annexation of the property will eliminate the enclave. It is proposed that the property be assigned a future land use map designation of residential low and a zoning atlas designation of low medium density residential. Any questions on agenda item 7.3? This will go on our agenda for Thursday night, 7.4. <coughs> Approve amendments to Beach by Design, a preliminary design for Clearwater Beach and design, design guidelines to update the public boardwalk standards in Marina District boardwalk design guidelines and specifications and pass the appropriate ordinance on first reading. Mr. Brother. Thank you, Cobb. Rather, Planning and Development. Uh, so this proposed ordinance updates the Marina District design guidelines and specifications. Um, and during construction of the Papaya Street uh, entry note, the design and materials used were modified from what the specifications called for originally. Uh, this amendment updates the guidelines to reflect what was constructed at the Papaya Street entry node and incorporates updated citywide standards for benches, trash cans, trees, and landscaping. Uh, the proposed changes also address finished materials, lighting, trash receptacles, benches, landscaping, and the boardwalk construction materials, uh, timber piles, decking, and railings, for example. Section diagrams of the boardwalk and East Shore Drive sidewalk uh, have also been revised and the updated guidelines will ensure any privately constructed portion of the boardwalk is consistent with what has already been constructed. Uh, the Community Development Board, after conducting a public hearing on October 15, 2019, recommended unanimous approval of this amendment. And if you have any specific questions, Kevin Dunbar, Director of Parks and Recreation, is here to answer those. Questions for staff on 7.4? Mr. Publis. It, it seems to me we adjusted and amended the ordinance after we built it first. Did we? Was there a reason we switched materials and specifications initially and then kind of fixed the ordinance afterwards? It just seems a little backwards. Uh, again, Kevin Dunbar, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, we did the first piece, which was the Papaya Street um, piece. And so as part of that construction, there's a series of things that we learned <clears throat> that weren't successful one also at the same time like the example of trash receptacles um, the original plan was to use the same ones that we did on beach walk uh, those wound up failing uh, we went with a different one so it's more in line with just keeping things uh, updated and making sure that everything is consistent with what we're doing so this was this is actually an improvement on design it's an yeah it's, it's an improvement and um, I would tell you it wouldn't surprise me at some point in the future that we don't come back again because we have found some other things may not work quite as it was anticipated, but we want to make sure that whoever is doing any work out there understands specifically what they'll be required to do. And so this is just an update of that. Makes sense. Thank you. Mr. Condon. My question is related to that. Uh, so we found things that, that didn't work when we built the uh, Papaya Street what's already been built. Have we gone back and fixed those things, or did we fix them as we were doing it? The latter. We, 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 we did those as, as we were doing it. We found what was successful. Um, 
And so now it's time to update this document so that as the rest of the boardwalk is built, everything looks consistent. Any other questions, Council? There's some new construction going on on the property. Just to the north? Just to the north, yes. right. Are they going to be doing a, a board? Yes, sir. Well, I guess part of that. So is it going to be connected or is it just going to be by itself or not because there's nothing there to connect? No, it'll be, it'll connect, it'll, yeah. it will connect to the Papaya Street Plaza. Okay, so that work then will be consistent? That's, that's, that's one of the reasons to get this done. And they're, they're aware of all this. Okay. And they're, they're, they're waiting for these and they've already agreed to that they would follow this. Okay, so, so they, we're not surprising them by making these changes yeah, yeah. and they're agreeable to the changes? I'll, I'll let you go ahead and respond to that, but yeah, absolutely. I'm not aware of the development. Yeah, okay. But I'm sure Alec Randall or Gina Clayton could answer that specifically if they're here. They have been in for permits, and I'm sure that there's been conversations with Parks and Recreation on what the appropriate materials are, because the goal clearly is to match the entire boardwalk as right. piece by piece gets built. Okay. Yeah, and we have, we have a letter from the representative stating exactly what Gina just said. That they're okay? Okay. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to go back to them before Thursday night, then? No. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on council? We'll have this on our agenda for Thursday night. 7.5. Approve amendments to the Code of Ordinances amending Chapter 25, Public Transportation Carriers, Article 1, Public Conveyances to Define Micro-Mobility Device Motorized Scooter and Shared Mobility Device Provider, and make other amendments to related definitions to establish standards for micro-mobility devices to require a license for shared mo mobility devices offered for rent within the city and to add penalties and pass the appropriate ordinance on first reading, Mr. Park. Good morning, Council Mayor. Um, I'm here to bring to you uh, an ordinance where we are amending and adding um, factors, Chapter 25, public conveyances, um, in order to have the legal um, wherewithal for a pilot a mobility program as well as to basically have some standards set. Um, as you probably remember that there was a statute passed by the state in June and at that time it allowed uh, micromobility devices the full rights and responsibilities of bicycles um, and the City Council uh, passed a moratorium. The moratorium will expire on December 17th of 2019. So we want to get these standards, some standards and some guidance um, into our code of ordinances. Um, and that's the first part of this. The second part is related to the pilot program, um, some details that are provided in a separate document about the pilot program. Uh, what we're pro proposing today are adding definitions, establishing standards for micromobility devices, adding penalties, providing guidance for what is called shared device rentals, and those are rentals that far out, fall outside the scope of what micromobility actually um, applies to. And we also want to um, show some areas that where riding such devices or providing rentals are, is prohibited, such as Clearwater Beach, Island States, and Sand Key. So um, we've been working a long time with Matt Smith and our internal staff to develop this program and um, we bring it to you today to um, move forward on these um, the ordinance amendments. Questions for staff on 7.5? No question. Well, I, have, I do have one looking at it. So you, if I may, thank yeah, you, Mayor. Mr. Pogleis. Thank you. So. Yeah, I read the ordinance, and yeah, establishing policy is going to be a critical first step. Um, then the third attachment to this, so we still haven't decided on all of that yet. These are just staff recommendations that will come back to us later. Well, what we're proposing for the pilot program are that they, they move forward with these standards to develop the pilot program during the RF, um, RFP process. Okay. That's where we work with the operators and vendors fine-tune it um, so at that time we 
we want approval to move forward with these standards and to work with the operators, um, and then we would, and you know, start the pilot program. We would not come back to the city council for yeah. uh, adoption of the pilot program. So this is the pilot program, and these are the streets that are identified where we're going to engage in RFP. That is correct. Okay. Any other questions, Council? Mr. Well, Hamilton. I guess this is strictly about uh, scooters in downtown Clearwater, correct? This this does not address any potential um, future, um, like, does this have anything to do, how would this apply to, say, if we were to allow it or if it were to come, someone came forward with it, uh, pedal pub in downtown Clearwater would that would this address that or do we have to totally do something different for something of that magnitude versus small scooters yes you would um, I believe there are some um, guidelines being developed in ordinance form for the code re, uh, for pedal pubs this is strictly for motorized scooters micro mobility devices as as the definitions in the state statute and that the city is proposing, that we are proposing to adopt today. So those other, that's why we added it as section four to where we already have low, low speed vehicles and pedicabs adopted. So this, that really worked well as far as having a separate section for just motorized scooters and micro mobility devices. Okay, I, I saw Jim come up, so oh. yes. Sure. Um, Jim Hallio, Assistant City Manager. I can address the uh, question regarding uh, pedal pubs or megacycles. Actually, uh, Mr. Smith and I have been working on uh, an ordinance that we would need to change to specifically address the, uh, the pedal pubs and uh, megacycles. Uh, the first draft of the ordinance uh, that Mr. Smith has created um, is out for review, and we also have uh, the application process is all set. So once we have that ordinance, um, kind of finalize and hammer it out with the details, we'll bring it forward to you to discuss with the application procedure also, as we've been working with uh, planning and zoning and code compliance to develop a specific tailored application for that um, specific use. Okay. Mr. Aubrey. Okay, so this is just to approve the amendments to the ordinance to conform with the state uh, uh, ordinance, and you're going to come back to us with a, uh, a plan on where we're going with this, uh, yeah. using this, or what? Um, so this ordinance, um, as he stated, our um, moratorium is expiring, so we need to put something in place. Otherwise, you could rent scooters anywhere you wanted to. Um, so this prohibits the rental of scooters uh, unless you have a license with the city or you're a, a participant in the pilot program. So. When you say conform with state law, I mean state law authorizes us to regulate the scooter, so that's what we're doing. So we're we don't want to, to just fall to the to the level where they can just do whatever they want. Okay, but uh, all right. Any other questions, Council? Mr. Condo. On the um, document called the Micro Mobility Pilot Program Staff Recommendations uh, at the bottom, hang on, um, you say no license shall be granted to allow shared mobility devices, device provider operations in Clearwater Beach, Sand Key on the states or any other area restricted pursuant. <clears throat> so uh, if we pass that, then it will not be allowed in those areas. And uh, do I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, and then should it should it not say motorized mobility devices, because we already have shared rentals uh, of other uh, mobility devices. Well, there are other types of devices such as the uh, pedal assisted mm -hmm. or non pedal assisted bicycles and things. We you know spend a lot of time trying to um, allow certain types of motorized devices that are, are small in stature. What we were worried about, though, as far as the motorized, shared mo motorized devices, we we're worried that 
micromobility only refers to using a reservation system. Um, and we were concerned about where someone could have a, um, an area at the beach and all of a sudden have 50 devices that people could walk in and rent. So we are not, you know, so worried about that in other parts of the city, but the, the council had made clear that we didn't want to have um, you know, a, a horde of these devices. And there seemed to be this distinction between reservation system and privately owned where somebody could come in and rent directly from a, an operator or a store a device. Um, and so we were trying to make sure that that did not occur at the beach. Is that My specific question is to the word mobility, shared mobility device. We have bicycles now with, uh, that can seat, what, three people, four people, uh, that are already rentals on the beach. This seems to be outlawing that. Uh, council member, the, the, uh, the shared mobility, it only refers to, it's in the definitions, it only refers to uh, micromobility and motorized scooters. And the intent there was um, we didn't want, staff did not want uh, the hotels on the beach being able to rent um, scooters because technically those would not be micromobility scooters. So if you just had motorized scooters and you rent them out for the day, those are not micromobility devices because they're not rented, they're not reserved online through an app. Um, so the intent was to capture all those and so that you don't have any rogue operators down on the beach, you don't have any rentals of scooters whatsoever. Um, and the language had to be crafted that way to be consistent with Florida statutes. We didn't want to depart from the, the very specific um, definitions that Florida statutes had created to create confusion down the road. Okay. So what we're talking about are what in the vernacular, I think, is e-scooters. Correct. E-scooters e -scooters is, is what Florida Statutes is calling micromobility. Okay. And the only difference between a micromobility device and a motorized scooter is that the micromobility device can be rented or reserved online or through, through a computer software. There's no other difference. It's just that online. So when you think of micromobility, you're thinking of, um, you know, all the other cities that have the scooters that are dropped off and you can look at your Uber app or whatever and, and reserve your scooter. But you could also have a motorized scooter that people are going to just run out or hotels might just run out on the beach. Uh, so that's what we want to avoid and that's why we created the term shared mobility device provider. So what we're saying is that on the beach a hotel operator cannot rent out a scooter. That is correct. correct. That, that's so let's make sure that we are, we're understanding that okay the um, d did y'all have any other questions before I continue here a second Mr. Uh, what? this still does not prohibit the use of personal scooters not at all if someone owns one that's theirs and they use it but they just again they are required to obey the same laws as bicycles and mm -hmm. cars Correct. It can't ride it on a sidewalk. Got to be, and well, actually, it, well, <laughs> well. So this ordinance does not address personally owned motorized scooters whatsoever. Um, so that falls to the state law, which is all the rights and responsibilities of bicycle. So, mm -hmm. a personally owned scooter could be ridden on the sidewalks. Okay. We do, but the council does have the ability to regulate that as well. But that's not in this ordinance. Um, there was a report on the radio from the success or lack of success in Tampa with the use of these items. A, where you drop them off. Are we addressing where the drop-offs have to be? Yes, we are, sir. And where um, we yeah, Tampa uh, has, they have what are called corrals, which are, um, the device parking areas, but those are only uh, required to be used by the operators for when they stage them in the morning or rebalance them. Outside of that, the users in Tampa are allowed to leave them anywhere um, except in pathways and you know blocking access, things like that, those, those standard state safety practices. What we are doing here is we're further prescribing it where we will have users will be required to use the corral areas as well. 
Um, you know, safety is a key issue. You know, Chief Slaughter has continued to let us know we need to provide safety. Um, these corrals will be, need to be in many areas, so we're going to work on identifying those areas. They don't have to be large. They can be as small as one or two feet wide where users can park them, but still have the efficiency and the accessibility to quickly get to a scooter or quickly leave it uh, near their destination. But we are requiring parking areas to be used by users. Okay. Uh, th that same study that I had seen about Tampa had said how much the emergency room figures for treating people with injuries had increased since these scooters were allowed in Tampa, and mainly because helmets were not required. Uh, I, I note here that we're, we're suggesting that they have free or discounted helmets would be offered, but there's no requirement that that be. No, the, the operators um, may have a requirement, but they, you're able to sign off using the reservation system. This is something, though, that we've, um, you know, required helmets are, they're not required for riding a bicycle and such, and they're, it's very, um, well, the, all the operators have said, you know, requiring somebody to wear a helmet is something that will not, the program just won't work because approximately 3%, another study I saw, the, the Austin study, said approximately 3% of the riders wear helmets. Um, we are trying to establish, it's not only the helmets, it's also the first time riders that have a, a high incidence of uh, crashes. So the operators provide training sessions, they provide, you know, real life training sessions, uh, discount coupons online and during the training sessions, a variety of ways that we are going to continue to explore to make helmets easily available and readily accessible to everyone so that you know, per income and things like that are not um, pro you know, prohibiting their use. Uh, talk to us about uh, Clearwater Mall or Countryside Mall areas or the St. Pete College area. Right. At this time, those standards are, would be falling under the, the state guidelines where people on scooters would be able to uh, ride in those areas the same places that a bicycle is allowed to, to ride. So right now, we are just focusing on the, the beaches, Sand Key, and Island Estates and the downtown pilot program as such, and then the rest of the city would fall uh, be regulated under the state statute. So if a vendor wanted to, to provide this service in the Clearwater Mall or the Countryside Mall area, he would be able to do so without these regulations being in effect? Well, they would have to get a, a license. So uh, for a micromobility provider, um, I, if I Correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but uh, I believe they would only be allowed to operate within the downtown area. So, the, the falling under the state statute and not regulated, that only applies to personally owned scooters. Okay, if you're running scooters, this, this, or, this ordinance says you have to have a license or you have to be a part of the pilot program, and that's up to council um, to say, yeah, the Pilot program's good, that's what we want, and, and staff is recommending that that be downtown. So there are no, I don't think there's a staff recommendation now to have scooters anywhere else rented outside of downtown unless council directs differently, but I think that's what staff is recommending and that's what council has discussed in the past. So there's not going to be any rentals anywhere else. Um, for at least the pilot program, I think the intent is to look at the success uh, of the pilot program and, and go from there six months or a year down the road. Okay. Okay, this will be on our agenda then Thursday night. Thank you. Thanks. 7.6. Approve the second amendment to an existing development agreement between uh, Triprop Clearwater LLC as assigned by Alanic Properties and Co Holdings LLC, Nakata Holdings LLC, the property owner and the City of Clearwater for property located at 401, 411, 421, 425, and 431 South Gulfview Boulevard, which adds Exhibit A-1 
to provide an updated legal description to include parcel 0729155238000780 to the subject site and replaces Exhibit B with Exhibit B-1 to provide new conceptual site plans and elevations, updates Exhibits C and D regarding any reference to the legal description and proposed number of overall hotel units, adds Exhibit E, which provides specific language germane to the pedestrian bridge regarding construction and maintenance, and sets a new date by which by which time site plan approval must be obtained, authorized, uh, and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same and adopt resolution 19-23. Ms. Crandall. Uh, Crandall, Planning and Development. No changes have been made to the development proposal that was presented at the November 7th, 2019 Council meeting, although there have been two changes made to the development agreement. Those changes are that the minimum number of parking spaces to be made available to the public above and beyond those otherwise required by the Community Development Code has been included in Section 4.2. That number is 230 parking spaces. Also, Section 6.1.3.5 has been added, which specifies that access to the public right-of-way from the proposed pedestrian bridge is prohibited. In addition, there's been um, changes to the recitals to the Second Amendment to reflect that the applicant has closed on the purchase of the property that was proposed to be added to the subject site. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions on Agenda Item 7.6? 4.2. Four point two just says that the project will include a minimum of two hundred and seventy two parking spaces. It doesn't say that two hundred and thirty of them will be public parking spaces. So it increases the number of parking spaces from two hundred seventy two to two hundred ninety eight. It specifies a minimum of two hundred thirty spaces in addition. Okay, that, that's in your, because it's not in, in what I've got. That's why I'm, unless I'm not looking at the right place. The, uh, Mayor, in, excuse me, Michael Fulwin, Assistant City Attorney, in the development agreement itself, it lists the actual spaces, and I think the 298 <laughs> is what the hotel has to have per their density, and then it'll also say, in addition to that, there will be 230 okay. public spaces. Okay, okay. I, because I don't know that that's what we had talked about, but it referenced the um, 4.2 and 4.2 <coughs> on my sheet just says the project will include a minimum of 272 yeah. spaces. I do know it's in the agreement. Okay. okay. This will be on our agenda then Thursday night. Thanks. 8.1. Authorize award of invitation to bid number 56-19, Police Clothing and Equipment, the Dolls LLC of Lexington, Kentucky, for an annual not to exceed amount of $75,000 with option for one, one for two one-year term extensions and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same chief's law. Good morning, Council. Dan Slaughter, Chief of Police. Uh, this is, uh, as stated, a blanket purchase order for the amount of $75,000 for one year with two uh, one-year extensions available with Galls Incorporated. Uh, Galls is the recommended vendor after we conducted an invitation to bid process. Uh, the process, um, or the purchase order, provides for the police department's uniforms and equipment, and this includes not only the duty clothing, but the duty equipment, duty belts, and uh, other uh, material and items that they carry with them uh, in their duties on the road and the um, the um, the employees includes more than just your police officers your school resource officers I mean your uh, school crossing guards your police service technicians your telephone reporting unit your volunteers and uh, all of our employees that wear uniform clothing or uniform equipment um, there was only one other vendor that participated in the uh, bid and that was GT distributors but they chose to only uh, bid on the um, the, uh, the equipment segment and not the uniform. So we are recommending GALS since they will be a single vendor for all the equipment. Any questions of staff on 8.1? Consent? Yes. 9.1. Declare list of vehicles and equipment surplus to the needs of the city. Authorize disposal 
through sale to the highest bidder at the Tampa Machinery Auction, Tampa, Florida, pursuant to City Code Section 2.622, surplus personal property, and authorize the appropriate officials to execute same. Mr. Conson. Good morning, Craig Conson, Fleet Manager. Council previously approved the vehicle replacement list in October. This agenda item is requesting Council to declare surplus the vehicles and equipment in detail to be replaced per this list and authorize disposal via auction at the Tampa Machinery Auction. Any questions on 9.1? Nope. Consent? Yep. 10.1, <clears throat> Mr. Hall. Uh, item 10.1, request authority to settle case of City of Clearwater versus Ava Anthony LLC. Case number 18-8490-CI. And Mr. Fuino will address this. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Good, ma uh, good morning, Mayor, members of Council. Michael Fuino, Assistant City Attorney. This agenda requests authority to settle uh, a municipal lien foreclosure case. The property has been brought into compliance. The owner has agreed to pay $10,000 which should cover both the uh, attorney's fees and costs, as well as the city's administrative costs. The uh, property owner has also agreed that if the property comes out of compliance at any time, that the city is entitled to an immediate foreclosure judgment in the full amount of the lien. Um, the uh, legal department, myself, thinks that that's a fair and adequate situation, so we would ask for authority to uh, settle the case on those terms. Any questions on 10.1? Consent? 10.2. Item 10.2, request authority to institute a civil action on behalf of the city against Bayonet Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning, LLC, to recover $1,439.19 for damages to city property. Uh, Mayor, members of council, we have, uh, we're seeking authority to institute a suit against this company for damages they did to a gas line in the Land Lakes area. They damaged it with a piece of ex excavation equipment, and our damages are as stated, $1,439.19. They've been not responsive to any endeavor on our part to, to settle the matters. Okay. Questions? Consent? 10.3 is a second reading. Any questions on the second reading? Okay, Council, let's go ahead and take a recess until 1045 because I imagine the, the next subjects may take some time and that way we won't have to break in the middle of it. Okay? We'll reconvene at 1045.
like to reconvene the work session for November the 18th, agenda item 11.1, Mr. Horn. There, yes, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Delk and Gina. They're gonna handle both those items. Yeah, uh, Mayor, Council, Michael Delk, Assistant City Manager. Want to uh, uh, incorporate with our Imagine Clearwater update today the uh, kind of an overview of where we are with the City Hall site selection. Uh, we ask, uh, as you're well aware, I think we've got the downtown redevelopment plan, we've got the CRA plan. Uh, you know, the uh, lot of factors going into the downtown are uh, work and efforts to revitalize downtown and the park. So in terms of uh, looking at the site selection of City Hall, we ask uh, uh, the city engineer, the city CRA director, and the uh, director of planning and development to take a look at uh, the various sites and opportunities that we have downtown and kind of weigh those and uh, look at how they, uh, we might want to evaluate them strategically. So Gina, if you would please, maybe uh, walk the city council kind of through the, the criteria and, and where we are so far. And understanding as well that you, we've got a short timeline uh, to bring something back to you right after the first of the year. Sure, thank you. Gina Clayton, Planning and Development Department. We can get the slides up. Um, we all know that there is a variety of things you need to look at as you're making this decision um, to select a site for City Hall. And obviously cost are an important factor, cost of real estate, cost of building the project, and then that of operating it. But we also think that there are other important factors that you need to consider. Uh, and in particular, what kind of impact City Hall can have on downtown and the city as a whole. And so while cost may be a main driver, we think there's a variety of other factors that you should consider to help you arrive at the right decision. And with that in mind, uh, we, meaning Tara and Amanda, and I have uh, developed criteria that we think will be very helpful for you to use in reaching a very objective, well thought out decision for the location of a new city hall. So what I'd like to do is walk through that criteria in the order of weight that we have assigned to the criteria and then show you some properties that we think we ought to evaluate in the pursuit of a new city hall site. Um, the first uh, objective, and we believe this is the most important in the selection uh, process, is how will this site help us implement our downtown redevelopment plan. Some of the guiding principles um, of the plan we think are very important in, in this exercise, and they are to uh, make sure that downtown is an economic center, that um, the uh, downtown is oriented to pedestrians, it's a place of quality urban design, and one with an integrated variety of uses. Specifically, there's one objective in the plan that addresses City Hall, and it states that the location placement and design of a new city hall should reflect the building's civic importance as a community gathering place. And we think this is really critical in citing uh, a new city hall. So when we look at um, evaluating against the criteria in this area, we've listed some things that you see up on the screen. And some of the things that we think are important is whether the site has low visibility or high visibility. Uh, does its location and orientation ensure a civic prominence for City Hall? Um, is the site situated so that the City Hall can be a focal point for the downtown and for the community and the whole, or is it just going to be lost in a sea of other buildings? Uh, we also consider if City Hall would have a positive impact on the character district in which it's located, how will it support the vision of that character district and can it be built within the intensity and height limitation that the district has. Um, some other considerations, and this is a really important one, especially from the CRA perspective, is can this site really help spur redevelopment of the surrounding sites um, and does it have good access for all modes of transportation and is it in uh, close proximity to other city facilities. So we think these things should guide us in determining um, a score for implementation of the uh, downtown plan. The next criteria revolves around real estate considerations. Uh, we will be evaluating the sites based on ownership. Does the city own it? Does the CRA own it? If not, do we have willing or unwilling property owner? Um, 
does the site have a low or high potential for a public-private partnership? We think this is uh, could be a very positive uh, thing with the new city hall site. Another consideration is, is the site in or out of the opportunity zone? That would help with public-private partnerships if it is. And then last, um, would the site be construction ready or would it involve any demolition or renovation of a building? Uh, the next uh, in order relates to general site characteristics. Specifically, obvious one, is the site big enough to accommodate a city hall or is it a too tight of a fit? Is the parcel configuration conducive to siting the city hall or does it make it challenging? Is there enough land area to accommodate parking on site or could it be served by off site parking or some combination thereof? Uh, we'd also obviously look at uh, things like um, topography and tree canopy and infrastructure needs and also um, as we have in downtown we have some environmental considerations and contamination we'd want to uh, be cognizant of. And then the last criteria uh, in our rankings is cost and while we know that's certainly important um, we didn't want it to drive the whole exercise as I stated at the beginning. Key considerations in this area though obviously or does the city or the CRA own the site? Um, if not, do we anticipate that uh, the cost will be high or low for acquisition? Um, would we have to build a new building or is it a property that we could renovate? And what would be the cost of each of these in terms of initial uh, cost as well as ongoing cost? And then lastly, um, we think it's important to also look at a site to see if it can accommodate both City Hall and MSB operations. And so with that, I guess I'll stop and see if you have any comments or questions about the criteria that we've developed. And if not, I'll go on and talk about the sites that we're looking at. Any questions so far? I, I, I think the key one that you, you said, Gina, was at the beginning was visibility and you know iconic mm -hmm. so that you know the people will know that this is the city hall and it can't get lost right yeah yes we agree with that great okay so to help us in the site mm -hmm. selection um, we really think, think it's yes, important it to cast a wide net and think outside of the box in terms of identifying potential sites and Would our goal was to look throughout the entire downtown and identify a very diverse list of sites. Um, so you'll see that there are some sites that may involve some renovation or new construction. And we also looked at the entire downtown plan area. And um, in deciding which sites to look at, we um, used some information that Williamson Dakar had provided us um, on the size of a property that we need for City Hall, which is about two acres. You'll find, though, there's sites here that are larger than that and some that are a little bit smaller. Um, so we have identified at this point nine properties to evaluate, and as you can see on the map, they include a mix of property types and sizes, um, a variety of ownership, and a variety of locations throughout the downtown. And while on the surface, some of the sites may seem more worthy than others, we felt that a full evaluation um, of properties across the site selection criteria will help lead you to choosing the right site for City Hall. We have um, two more tasks, and one is actually to go through and evaluate the criteria. We wanted to get your confirmation that we were looking at the right criteria, and then we're also in the process of hiring a design professional who's going to help uh, develop conceptual studies and sketches for our top three ranked sites. Um, we have already issued that RFQ. Last week was the deadline. We received five proposals back, and this week we'll be evaluating them and hopefully making a selection. Um, that exercise obviously will help us determine the pros and cons um, of our top ranked sites and it'll identify any sort of buildability issues that we may have with that. Um, as Michael noted, we're on a very tight time frame to get all this done. Um, we know that you'd like to see this back uh, probably in February, and so um, we will be working hard to do that and bring it back for you for your consideration. Um, we, Amanda is here and uh, Tara is here, so if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Any questions, Council? Any uh, 
do you want thoughts <coughs> as to, or do you want to wait until you rank them first? We'd like to go through the process and rank them and then okay. bring them back that, for that, your that, consideration. That, so, so that means, Council, don't say which site you favor. Not yet. Okay. Not, I'm okay. not going to say which site I favor. But it's also not going to be a question. But I think for food for thought and something to take under consideration, a site to be considered that's not on this list is the building we're sitting in right now because we talk about it wanting to be a community gathering site. We're talking about redoing Imagine Clearwater and engaging and trying to engage this building with what we're doing down there. We're talking about putting, you know, the, the plans we've already looked at and, and approved for, for this building include cafe and, and getting the public into the building. Sometimes that's not necessarily conducive to, quote, unquote, the traditional library environment, noise and things of that nature. But if we were to put City Hall, convert this building into City Hall with the uh, commercial uses, the cafe and things of that nature, and the, the rooftop availability, getting the rooftop available for, for, for rent and for, for uh, ideas and uses, um, then we look at a site to build another library, to build a new library that would be for library use. I, I, I think this location in this building, it's an iconic building. It's, not, it's a half a block further away from our municipal service building than the old, than the origin, the old city hall. I think this building has great potential to be our city hall. And it's not, one of a, it's not one of the locations that is being proposed to us right now. And I, I don't know what the rest of the council feels, but that's my take on it. I think we, it becomes a much more public in, publicly engaged building as a city hall than it does as a library. I'll put that out there. Y'all can, can chew me up or do whatever you want with it. I think we've had that conversation in the past and uh, we weren't necessarily inclined as a council to support it and I don't think the community was necessarily inclined well, to support it. Well, I asked it. the city, I asked the city attorney uh, to do some, do some research because I was on the council or I got on the council shortly after the referendum that the city, the people of Clearwater passed that said, you will build a new library we want you to build a new public, new main library, and you will build it on this site. Now, I don't know if there were any caveats to that, yeah. and she was supposed to be looking into it. I haven't got those those right. answers yet, but I just think this building has plenty of square footage to put in who we who who we've who got displaced out of the original city hall into this building and still have the room for the the commercial uses that we want to see and get the foot traffic into this building that we want to see. That takes care of our uh, new city hall, and then we have to build, instead of building a new city hall, we're building a new library. Let's, let's not have a you know, further discussion mm -hmm. on that. You've thrown it out. The, the, only, the only thing that I want to throw out is that, in my opinion, it's imperative that the city hall has all city employees together. I don't like a municipal service building two blocks away from City Hall, let alone four blocks away from City Hall or, or whatever. In my opinion, City Hall, where the administrative staff is, where the council is, where everybody comes to should be one building and not, oh, well, you have to go here or you have to go there. So that would be, you know, whether it be this facility or, or, or any site, I think we need to look at combining MSB and City Hall so that it's one. I thought we were going to so, listen to the rest of the presentation. Well, well, <laughs> I, I'm just saying in, in terms of you know what you know what guidance you know that I that's important to me. Well, but with your thoughts and Councilmember yeah. Hamilton's thoughts, maybe the rest of the presentation can 
gather some more information. Well, that, 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 that's, and, why, we, that's yeah. why I threw that well, out. For instance, when you said that, I would be interested to know square footage MSB yep. and yep. City Hall combined. Yep, right. Maybe because this site does work for that. It, 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 it may, because yeah. the MSB building it, you know, could be at it, the end of its useful life. And we yeah. talked about the MSB remodeling that and spending a lot of money for customer service and yeah. you know, doing something different with the building department. Um, and we, which we haven't done yet. Right. So. Well, if I could, that's definitely on our list of things to consider. And we think, we don't have a firm number yet, but probably somewhere between 90 and 100,000 square feet is what we'd need to accommodate a combined uh, City Hall MSB. Um, so we definitely have some larger sites that we could consider. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to look at. Reusing the MSB garage, would it be in close proximity so we didn't right. wouldn't have to build all the new parking? Yep. So a lot of things to consider. Okay. Mr. Horn? All right, Mayor, Council. So as my understanding now, after some of these comments, is that you want us to incorporate your comments into what we have done thus far. Is that my understanding? I think that's why we're talking. Well, I'm a little confused. That's why yeah. the, the, the mayor was kind of talking about, well, let's don't get into it. But then, we you did. know. Well, he threw out a new site to consider. Well, but but then what's the difference? What, what, well, that's what I'm asking. Okay. Do we consider the additional site? Do we consider the criteria that you laid out that said well, one city hall? Because some of these things are not on the, have not been on the table for us. That's why I just want to make sure that we, if you want us to respond to it, that you tell us. Well, I, I, I think. Mr. Hamilton brought it up, and I, I, what I brought up was, okay, while you're looking at these sites, have you considered well, they do in the present. Th their ability to accommodate everybody, or in Mr. Hamilton's case, have you considered looking at this site? You know, you may come back to us and say, hey, we, we had looked at this site, but we didn't consider it based on the request that he had made of the city attorney that it's not an, an option. Well, it, it, the way I was approaching it is that if you want us to consider it, then tell us to consider it, as opposed to saying if you, because you're giving us the opportunity to exercise some discretion when you really want us to consider it. So well, it, it sounds like you really want us to consider it, right? Well, I, well I, I've said from the very beginning that to me, a city hall should be a city hall for everybody. Right. You, okay. you have said that, but I, I'm trying to make sure that we've got the corporate I, I'm fine. I mean, I you know my thoughts, and I can accommodate both these thoughts mm -hmm. into mine. So okay, sounds good. Well, I'm a definite okay. yes. I'm a definite yes. Okay. Okay. But I mean, I still want the benefit of the rest of the presentation. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Because there's yeah. going to be more data about sure. the MSB consolidation somewhere in this presentation because it was one of your only one point, but it was a consideration. The presentation, I finished the presentation. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought there's nothing else coming. No, 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 it, just, it, just said, it just said that she's coming back. one of the yeah, sites that be considered oh. that they're going to review and rank is yeah. the MSB site. Yeah, but we got, we have four attachments. We've only been through two. Well, Final sites? So, uh, wait a minute. No, she has. She, oh. they, they, Did we go through all four? Uh, the, the one attachment just told you, provided you information about the sites that are on About the nine, yeah. yeah. About yeah. the nine sites. Right. Okay. About the but nine sites, how large they are, who it. owns them, which character they right. and which character district they're in. They have to be valued. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Mr. Maxwell. Just wanted to you know, make sure you're aware we will likely adjust the criteria to elevate the MSB combo from the one point to mm -hmm. another, to some other level. So mm -hmm. when you bring it back, it's going to be a little bigger than what you're saying. And if I make clarification, is this building, as I recall, 90,000 square feet? This one, I don't know. It's 100. I don't know if Michael knows. It, it's it's, it's it over 90. 000. It's 90. It, yeah, it's 90,000. Yeah. It, it, over it, it was requested to go to 120,000, okay. but the council decided uh, 90,000. Okay. Staff, you may not realize, the staff had recommended 66,000. Right. Yeah. So those were the three, but it, it's 90,000. Could I get clarification as to this site to be considered? 
I'm not sure if I'm supposed to consider this site or not, the library. Yes. For me, yes. <laughs> Mayor, your mom. <laughs> Well, well, well I, I, I'm curious as to what the city attorney, you know, I, I did not know the point that Mr. Hamilton had raised about the referendum saying that the library had to be on this site. I mean, that because that I remember because I, mean, I was on that council and yeah. it was, I mean, you know, our hands were I'm, tied. It wasn't just that you're going to build a new library, you're going to build yeah. it on this site. But, but, but I, I don't what, know what if I there was a date certain that it, you know. But what I will say is that I don't want a library and a city hall in the same building. No, no. Well, yeah, well, that's yeah. why he... I'm would, saying if yeah. you make this city hall, yeah. we'll build a new library yeah. but, on but, but, maybe one of these sites. But, 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 but keep in mind then that your costs go up tremendously because you're building a new city hall. You're retrofitting right. Cheaper, a building. Yeah, but you're retrofitting a building. We have money in a budget to build the, to build a new city hall. Right. So that money could go into the retrofitting in, in the, of this building. And then building a specific, just a library building that doesn't have to be 90,000 square feet right. like this one was designed is going to be a lot less expensive. So, Mayor, you, I, I just want to reinforce something you said earlier. We had had a discussion. We took City Hall out of the equation. That's why it, it was never in there. Uh, so now I, I think we need to just go ahead and, and, uh, and, and consider it so we can just put the issue to to bed one way or the other, and I think we, we have an idea of the kind of issues associated with doing it. Yeah. Um, and then I think uh, that way, since we're investing in uh, in getting some real good analysis uh, as a result of this, we might as well include it. In yeah. We, and, and we have to keep in mind that this is going to be hopefully not just a one or two year decision. It's going to be a 50 or 100 year decision that the City Hall building will, I mean, you know, you look at Tampa City Hall, you look at St. Petersburg City Hall, St. Petersburg is renovating its City Hall, and it, it's probably close to 100 years old, you know. Uh, we need to make sure that what we decide on is going to have that kind of a lifespan. All right, that was fun. <laughs> And Mr. Delk is going to continue on. Yes, we're going to go through uh, uh, kind of a, a little short summary here, a, an update, if you will, on a number of items. Uh, next, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Kurtz and uh, Catherine Corcoran from Engineering to update, update you all on kind of where we are with the 30% plans and what's happening uh, over the next few months as we move on with that project. Good morning, I'm Tim Kurtz, uh, the engineering department. I met with you uh, on one-on-ones two weeks ago from Thursday and very excited to show you the 3D modeling for Imagine Clearwater. At that time, I kind of reviewed some uh, timelines. So the schematic plans, 30% are complete. We've gotten our comments back. Um, some may have noted that those came in in two different sets, the civil infrastructure and the parks plans and then the architecture set. Uh, as we go into the design development or 60% plans, <clears throat> excuse me, we're still going to keep that as two separate uh, schedules just to keep them running concurrent. Part of that is our goal with the civil and infrastructure is to get ahead on the utilities. We'd like to start utility relocations as soon as practical. Uh, <clears throat> we do anticipate getting the submittal of the civil and infrastructure drawings uh, mid-January and then followed probably in early February with the park improvements and architecture submittal. Uh, as we move into construction, uh, we previously thought that the construction documents would be done in May, and that is still our goal. Uh, parks will be following shortly in June, and then the uh, architecture would be submitted in June also. Uh, construction phase, that's the interesting part where I am now. Uh, we have a CM firm, Skanska, that we have uh, invited to move forward with. Uh, I've had several meetings with them as well as our design teams. Um, a lot of good ideas coming out of that. Uh, possibly changing ideas about phasing, construction techniques and materials, a lot of cost savings and time savings as well. So I'm excited that when we bring their uh, pre-construction phase services to you in December, I'll have them here present to kind of talk about some of those ideas and where they're thinking. Uh, 
Kat's been working with me with regards to the library renovations. Um, they are on track to be, I don't know the firm date of when they're thinking of getting started with construction, but we don't know it just yet, but it is early next year. So uh, I guess there's another meeting tomorrow. And uh, if you have any other questions or specific information you're interested in, glad to answer. Help us out here. Yes, there's some more slides here. Are you just giving us the 30%? Who's yes, doing? I'll, I'll go through the rest. Gotcha, of okay. I was just kind of giving okay. you a hand yeah. where we are on the design right now. Okay. Mayor, one comment. Kat is the, and council is the staff person working with the school district on addressing mm -hmm. how that design of the, uh, the renovations to Clearwater High School is going to look or present on Gulf Bay. So, okay. I just want you to know, okay. put a name in the place. <laughs> She's the one that's uh, doing that work. All right, just want to mention here uh, for uh, the public records, our uh, public engagement dates coming up December 3rd, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, here at the main library. December 4th, uh, the following night, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Countryside Library. On December 7th, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Saturday, we will be uh, have a display at Countryside Mall. And then on December 10th, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the North Greenwood uh, Recreation Center, uh, wrapping up the public engagement, and then we'll be back uh, to kind of summarize uh, the outcome of that with you at a meeting, uh, our meeting in December, uh, later in December. So uh, just a, a brief update, HRNA study, the deliverable. Uh, I sent that to you all with a little uh, Friday update, so it's around 79 pages. I'm still in the process of uh, reviewing that document, so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, over the next uh, few days uh, as we meet one-on-one, -on -one, and I would anticipate a little more formal kind of presentation of that again at our uh, uh, meeting in December. So what we have from HRNA, the market scan and development scenarios have been submitted. Uh, the uh, economic analysis has been completed. We're going to have a phone call with HRNA this week about uh, the next step, which is a, uh, uh, the actual drafting of the request for proposal or what they are recommending right now, a uh, request for qualifications uh, for a response from a developer. Could be one property, could be three properties. So uh, that's part of what we want to strategize and talk to them about. And then I would expect to be following up with you either in our one-on-one -on -one meetings or with a, a work session over how we'll proceed with that. So uh, that's something that will be coming back. Hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to overlap having a request for proposal or qualifications as the case may be uh, out there in, uh, while we have ongoing construction. I think that might be a, a beneficial uh, to us potentially in terms of marketing the property. Uh, but I'm going to uh, be uh, talking with the city attorney's office. We're still going to uh, want to follow kind of how we back into a referendum uh, next summer. So uh, we'll talk to you more about how that's going to come together uh, very soon. The, uh, you may be aware the uh, Coachman uh, Park renaming uh, issue uh, was not uh, really didn't have the kind of productive discussion that we wanted to have before the Parks Board. Uh, some of that may be uh, my fault. I think it would have been ideal, uh, looking back, hindsight uh, to have gone to the Parks Board, made a form more formal uh, kind of presentation to them in terms of what our objectives are for the park and so on, and uh, also talk to them about the activation things that you all have seen and that we've showed to other boards. So uh, I think what we're going to do uh, is to uh, make note of it, our public engagement uh, sessions, the discussions that we've had about renaming the Park Coachman Commons, maybe try to find a, uh, have a little explanation of where, uh, kind of what the logic is and what we're trying to do to engage our community uh, through the renaming of the park properties. Uh, but get some feedback from them uh, when we have our uh, public meetings in December 3rd, 4th, 7th, and 10th. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to you and kind of let you know where that is. 
uh, what comments we've had along with all the other comments on the 30% plans and then maybe plan to uh, uh, to go back before the Parks Board in, in January to a regularly scheduled meeting and, uh, and this time show them a little bit more about what our overall objectives and plans are for the park. I think they'll uh, they would probably appreciate seeing that. So at any rate, that's uh, a little bit of kind of regrouping on the park naming thing uh, before we proceed on. And that's it. I'll try to answer any questions you have. Uh, yes, sir. Any, can I ask, yeah, ask Michael a question? I'm sorry? Can I ask Michael Yes, sir. Uh, since the park board is an advisory board, could you clarify exactly what the park board's recommendation was as a result of the meeting? Well, I think they, uh, they recommended uh, against renaming the park Coachman Park. Uh, from the minutes. You mean Coachman Commons? Coachman Commons. Excuse me. Coachman Commons. I'm sorry. I, the, and Mary, the reason I asked the question, I just want to maintain the integrity of our process. Right. Mm -hmm. The board is advisory to you all, and I just want to make sure we knew what exactly uh, what their uh, uh, recommendation was so Michael you're talking about going back to them is what I'm hearing you say yes I think you know they talked about having uh, just glancing here at the park some you know naming contests and that sort of thing I don't know that we would uh, recommend going through that kind of process uh, uh, we're all aware of how difficult it is to get folks to agree uh, uniformly on a plan much less uh, a name for a waterfront park so uh, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to provide some background to what we've discussed with you on the park naming uh, and get some generalized feedback on that. But I think we've established the Parks Board as the representative of the community in terms of making recommendations to you on the, on the park name. So we'll just uh, afford them a little more opportunity, a little deeper discussion on that in January. And then they can make their recommendation that we'll come back to you in February. Well, that, that's if that, the council wants to, wants to give them another chance. I mean, well, that yeah, that's true. It is advisory. So, that's true. Um, your plan was council is back. free to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. Your plan was to go back and, and, and you know after you had some more public engagement and see if uh, if they maybe you know had a different view of it. Correct. But but council, it is advisory, and and uh, so council, are you comfortable with with this with his approach? To right, this? council. I'm I'm going to jump in first here. Yeah. Because this, uh, in December, I'm going to be starting my 50th year in government service. And the one thing that I've learned, and it was reiterated uh, by Mr. Kunda, probably unaware, when he posted on Facebook something about the United States being a republic and not a democracy. If we were a democracy, we would have votes on every issue for the entire public to vote on. But we're a republic. We've been set up to elect representatives to make decisions. If, and I, I know there are candidates out there and there are people who are saying, you have to let the public decide. But if we're going to let the public decide on every aspect of the Imagine Clearwater plan, then 40 years isn't going to be enough to complete the plan and the implementation. And this is a classic example. Somebody wants to have a naming contest for Coachman Park. And if that contest comes back, eliminating the name Coachman Park we're going to have a civil war on our hands. So at some point, we've got to decide where we're, you know, what decision we're going to make. I am disappointed that the park board did not have an opportunity to know of these plans before it was brought to us. And, and I think it's fair to go back to them and let them know that this is the direction that we've given. To, to consider the Coachman Commons name. Uh, but again, to go out and have a listening session on whether or not we ought to rename the park, to have a listening session on, on this and a, a listening session on that. Like I say, it, it'll be 40 years and none of us will be here to see, see the park finished. 
Mr. Hamilton? I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Mayor. Government by referendum does not work. Yeah. It does not work at the, the, the expense, the cost. The, it, you talk about people think government moves slow now. Go, by, go with government by referendum. Um, and I know Councilmember Albright is probably in the same boat as me, but I am very good friends and know many people that are direct descendants of the Coachman family and members of and direct descendants of the Coachman family. And somebody put out there, again, God bless Facebook or whatever, uh, that we were talking about taking Coachman Park out of the, you know, the name away and people just got up in arms and like the Coachman family's been here longer than the city's been a city and this that, and the other. And it's like, we've never had anything in front of me to my knowledge that was gonna remove the name Coachman from what this you know, ultimately becomes. Uh, I think the, you know, my, my opinion was, you know, Coachman Commons still maintains the Coachman name, but it, it addresses the entire redevelopment area instead of the small portion that is currently Coachman Park. And to me, it kind of made sense. But, you know, it, again, the false information that gets out there through the Internet and, and whatever else, whatever source you want to name, it, you know, we're, you know, we have to deal with that nowadays. 50 years ago, we didn't have to deal with that. But you couldn't be more right with government. We are a republic. We are, we have elected officials, us. We're elected to make the decisions. The voters gave us their, their vote because they felt we were the best candidate to represent them. And we are here to make those decisions and cast those votes. And government by referendum has never and will never work. I will never, I am not a, you know, we can't sign that. Mr. Pogles. Thank you, Mayor. So we're here to make policy. And the policy we make is what is being considered is advisory boards. We take into that, we take into account that information. And we also take into account staff recommendation information based on their level of expertise, their skill set. But at the end of the day, we still create the policy and we don't always go along with staff and we don't always go along with citizen advisory boards. It's what we believe to be the best. We're here because it's what we believe collectively to be the best interest and direction of the city. And currently we're focused on economic development, revitalization of downtown, and many other arenas as well. But I think you can't lose sight of that fundamental, what our direction, what we're supposed to do. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Condo. Uh, the original idea as it went to a referendum was to leave Coachman Park where it is and call it Coachman Gardens. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be opposed to leaving Coachman Park, Coachman Park, where it is now, and then renaming the entire park maybe Clearwater Commons. Uh, that way we don't mess with, Clear, with Coachman Park. It's, it's where it always has been, but it's an enlarged concept. I mean, just a little the grassy gardens there and leave that as the lesson. But we're certainly, our intent is to build on our traditions, not to, not undermine them. So Coachman is a very important part of uh, our waterfront, has been for decades, and it will be for decades to come, I would assume, unless the council goes in a different direction. But I, you know, what on the other hand, I, I guess the, you know, the suggestion that I offer you is just, merely to try to uh, get, the, uh, get the item back before you, uh, ideally in a little more comfortable situation so we don't have uh, controversy about a beautiful name for a beautiful park. Uh, so, but I'm, I certainly would defer to you and it, it's well within your right to proceed with the naming. So uh, be happy to handle that however you want it. Mr. Mayor, what, Mr. Kind of. what we haven't had is a is a positive recommendation from part from the from the board from the uh, committee they've told us what they didn't want but what do they want they haven't helped us we are the same in that they just want to leave it coachman park i would imagine somebody there stated in support it was an elegant name so i guess it was not uniformly yeah. uh, well, well i think it would have been helpful looking back if uh, it would have been nice uh, uh, for the board to have presented the uh, kind of the the entire activation thing, I would like to have Mr. done Albert. that. 
So here's what I, this is my opinion. Um, I like Coachman Commons. I like when you came up with that name because it's, it's a name for the whole waterfront park. From Drew Street to Pierce, from Osseo, you know, from uh, the, the, uh, walk, the, the walkway down to the, the water. You know, we're going to have probably naming rights to parts of this park anyway. There's probably going to be whatever the kids' park is, is going to have a name to it. The green is going to have, the pavilion is going to have a name. Um, but I like it all inclusive to say Coachman Commons. But I imagine it's going to be like anything else. There's going to be specific names to parts of that park now. And, you know, those are things that will come un under decision and talked about later. I would agree. Sort, sort of like Don't Keep No, uh, Bobby Bowden Field at Don't Campbell Stadium at, you know, or. <laughs> well, you got you Ruth, know. you got the uh, Bumgardner, uh, you know, yeah. and, then, and then you got Ruth Eckert Ruth Hall, Eckert and Hall. then you got. Yeah. We may have a number of opportunities yeah. for. Okay. So, good luck. All right, thank you. <laughs> Back in your court. That was encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so did we decide we're not one bite of the apples what they get, or where are we at with this? Well, I, I, I think it, it's since they didn't yeah. get the presentation like before time that they at least ought to know the presentation. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm confident that when they hear the presentation that they're going to agree that Coachman Commons has a, cl a classy connection okay. for the entire imagine a clear water plan and we'll be as mm -hmm. supportive of that name as we are collectively now 100 percent agree and the only thing i would suggest as an add on consideration i don't if, if we can the 3d presentation that we saw that was extremely helpful encouraging motivating um are we ready to take that out i know it's only the 30 percent hoping that we'll have the ability to show the public that at our public meetings. Is any and all Along questions? with the library as well. The library's got a 3D out there too. I think any and all questions can be answered when you see that 3D, 3D model. It was really impressive. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, do you have anything further for us, Mr. Horn? No. No. Mr. Hall, do you have anything for us? Okay. 13.1, uh, Mr. Poglois. Thank you, Mayor. First, I want to thank Council Member Hamilton for just suggesting bringing up a, an idea that's old but yet new again, um, because what I what I noticed on the council here was um, it's kind of like impulsive, spontaneous, but we almost have a consensus enough to the point where we gave staff another place to consider. So that being said, I mean we come up with the best direction we think when we have when we have advisory boards and we have staff recommendations. The reason I bring this, this parking garage site up is because that now that we have bonding going to be um, approved here potentially very soon, and we have funding, and Michael Duck's talking about the first deer putting backhoes down in Coachman Park, the special event venue is going to lose all of its bluff parking, all of its down at the bottom bluff parking. We at one point identified our number one site for a parking garage. I think in light of moving this dive forward with everything we're doing on Imagine Clearwater, I think it's important to again identify the downtown parking garage site. The reason being because we're going to have a, a large loss of parking for special events, which are still contemplated to continue. And I think what's important to notice is that we have identified that before. Councilmember Hamilton said that you know, we don't necessarily need all the data and recommendations. We were there before just because maybe City Hall is not going to be on that site. It doesn't negate or remove the need to identify a downtown parking garage site. And the reason being I wanted to, to kind of talk about that today is because I don't necessarily think we have to identify how big, but we need to continue the conversations that were started with and the site that, of course, was identified a while back over a year ago was the PSTA and the county parking lot site. And if we don't identify that as our site, and that's not to say that we couldn't change that site, but this would at least allow us to begin those or, or re start those conversations again with PSTA and the county, because I know Mr. Maxwell had initiated that conversation. 
and unless something significantly different happens that would encourage us to identify another site um and i think there is potential there maybe there could be some happenings in downtown based on all of recent there's been a lot of sales in downtown property so i guess unless something significant happens where we would be encouraged to move to a different site i think we need to identify that site go with that as our premier site that's the site we're going to use and begin those conversations with county and psta again so that's where i'm coming from i don't i want to identify site and have those conversations because we're going to start tearing up coachman park and we we are not going to have uh, sufficient parking. I believe everybody also received the document from Bill Johnson that identifies additional shortfall of parking in downtown. So I think the conversation has to be had and with no disrespect to staff, they're going to do an analysis of the different potential sites, but I don't know that we need to have an overall analysis identifying five or six different potential sites. It was our number one site before. It is contiguous. It is strategically in the correct location. I think we need to take action and identify that as our downtown parking garage site. And that's what we're going to go with. When is the staff study supposed to be presented to us? This Maybe I'm a little confused. We're talking about now the city hall site or no, the no. parking garage or, or site? It's the downtown parking, parking garage. garage. Uh, well, the city hall work we're anticipating having back to you in, I think Gina said, February. But the parking site? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, currently, not, we're not studying a parking garage site, per se. Remember the city hall. CRA. Yeah. I mean, originally, we those, those were kind of linked. You know, we... We, we talked about both in the same breath, um, and uh, but accelerating a discussion on the parking garage uh, then now re requires us to, to be a little bit more definitive as to whether you all want to go in that direction. Well, one of the ULI recommendations was to be able, and we had those conversations <clears throat> when we were talking about a potential partnership with the county. In a, in a city hall shared downtown parking garage but just because the equation has changed and the county and the city are no longer necessarily contemplating a joint government use center we still have that need for a downtown parking garage based on criteria and data we've discussed over the past couple years. Are you of looking years. at it in terms of a, a city hall potential city hall location site that would also incorporate structured parking? Is that no this is structured parking parking the loss of parking downtown i mean it's the same conversation we've had with the cra director about the parking study analysis that came back saying in 10 years we're going to have a deficit of 500 spots so we know we're going to need a downtown parking garage and i'm still of the belief that we're going to need it sooner than later when you consider we're going to be tearing up 22 plus acres and all of that parking on the bottom of the hill goes away in potentially less than a year because you're going to be tearing up ground for infrastructure plumbing electric all of that stuff those lots are going to be gone which specific property were you referring to that was the the PSTA site, the PSTA the county parking lot it was the exactly it was identified a couple years ago as the number one site but but we can't do anything with that site until PSTA decides where it's going to go but we can't even have that conversation unless we identify it and then staff, well, Mr. Mack, somebody can. Well, it's, it's well, on they, the site selection list for potential city hall evaluation. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> it would be a combination. Of right. City hall and it, parking. Yeah, right, it, right. If city hall were to go there, it would be a combination. If city hall, yeah, it could go on top of, city hall could go on top of a parking, a structured parking garage. Mr. Hamilton. Well, I, I hope I'm, I'm trying not to contradict myself as I speak here, but um, I don't disagree that the PSTA site, PSTA County parking site, in my my personal opinion, is is probably the best site for a parking garage in downtown Clearwater because of geographic location and, and you know it's a two block walk to anywhere in the core of downtown. Um, or, or anywhere in downtown, really. But 
from a from a negotiation standpoint, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because, you know, I'm sorry Ms. Borcher's not here for PSTA still, but, but or maybe I'm glad she's not here to hear this, but, uh, you know, when, when you commit to something that you don't control, it makes the negotiation of obtaining it that much harder. And we haven't got that site under our control yet. And we that's what we need to be working on right now. We need to be focused on getting control of that site before we can commit that that's exactly what we're going to do to it. So it's, you know, and if we, if we sit here and say that's where we want our parking garage and there's no alternative location or anything under consideration, then we're basically telling PSTA, we're at your mercy, do what you want, you know, do what you need to to us. But we I'm have not, the site they I don't do want. want. To be in that, I don't want to be in that position. So. Mr. Yeah. Okay. So I've been thinking that this is the site that we should have a parking garage for probably close to two decades. This has always been my favorite place. Now, PSDA, uh, 10 years ago, uh, the city, let me just back up. The city of Clearwater thought that the best place for a transit center would be the co corner of uh, Court Street and Myrtle. So they bought out, bought properties there. Uh, and they have a big city owns a big property there, and that is the best spot for a uh, a transit center. PSTA knows this. PSTA's already started drawing conceptual plans there for their new bus terminal and multimodal site. So they already know that they're going to they're outside. This little place they have on Garden and Park is too small for them. They're even talking about spending money raising the roof so their electric buses can get under there. And I've, I'm on the board there and I've been telling them to hold off on that. Don't spend their money, just cut the roof off so the buses can go because I can see them spending money in another location soon. And that's gonna be at Court and, and uh, Myrtle. So we know PSTA and City of Clearwater are going to have a relationship because of the two lots. I'm not sure what we'll do with that, whether we'll trade them or some kind of a, it'll be a partnership. So all of this would do is tell the county, yes, we're interested in buying your surface lot, make us, give us the first right of refusal on it, and then we can move forward with planning something there that will really help all of downtown, plus it's a perfect walk to Coachman Park. Or you just, I'm sorry, or you just negotiate with the county, you know, that when whatever parking structure gets built, they get a certain amount of spaces in there to accommodate them for the spaces that they have, so. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused because we haven't changed our message. Our message is, is mm -hmm. has always been that that has been our preferred site, so I'm not exactly sure why we're having this discussion again. Well, with, with not identifying it currently, like now, there's no, I think, ex acceleration of the conversation with PSTA. What does that arrangement look like? Where are you with your funding? Just to make the conversations, begin negotiations, get them current and up to speed. We haven't identified a spot. So that being said, and, and the same thing, a conversation to start with uh, the county. PSTA has a money problem. Yeah, they, you know, so if we try to push them a little too fast, they're liable to say, "We'll pay us and we'll move out today." That's what I mean. PSTA, you know, it's like, so you, our you know, our, our position what hasn't changed. I don't think PSTA's position has changed, and we'll continue to work with them through our representative and through staff, and and you know. Well, can I reaffirm with my colleagues that it's still our number one site? It's the one we want to. Well, but that that has never changed. No one has brought up changing the the the, the recommendation or or, or the the okay. thought that that was a, a prior. So it is still our number one site. Everybody's still good with that. I believe so. You know. Okay. 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 Thirteen point two. Mr. Poblase. Um. So I thought staff was going there. Is Gina coming up to make a little presentation? Hi, Gina Clayton, Planning and Development. Back in September, you all discussed uh, corner lot fences and you asked us to do some research, and we have done that. We provided you information attached to this um, 
agenda item of nine communities that we surveyed and based on the information that we found the majority of those nine communities have regulations similar to ours three outright per uh, allow nine six foot high fences on corner lots that would be tarpon springs pinellas park and pinellas county the other communities that we surveyed uh, st pete st pete beach largo dunedin uh, hillsborough county um, they uh, limit fence heights to four feet on corner lots um, a couple of them do have provisions to allow some additional um, height based on situations like our code does so that's the research that we um, have found when when staff went back at the direction of council to do the research I was under the impression it was going to be to come back with some recommendations how to address the inconsistencies and the many many non-conformities that already exist in the city of Clearwater to possibly look at solutions or modifications um, and I'm not seeing any recommendations so so well, that would be your I wasn't here at the meeting I went back okay. and I watched the work session and I guess I had a misunderstanding that that was what we were directed to do I thought the direction was to provide you the, the research our recommendation as a staff based on what we allow in the situations we see is to leave the code as it is currently um, drafted if that's something that you want us to change you know we can certainly do that but our recommendation is that we don't make any changes to the fence code I think um, looking at the situation we have about 20,000 lots that are zoned low medium density residential and out of those we have 3,000 corner lots and then out of those we have about a thousand that are located on arterials and collectors so there's a very small number of lots in the city that you know is faced with this some would be allowed under that six foot provision based on lot configuration to have a fence so i think it's a pretty small number that's ultimately um, impacted um, you know, going back and rectifying non-conformities or illegally erected fences, I think, would be very time-consuming and difficult at best. Um, I think Clearwater would be in line with other communities, um, retaining the fence height at four feet, unless there's some mitigating circumstances that warrant a higher fence. Um, it, it appears that Dunedin is having a process right now to uh, allow flex flexibility based on the configuration of the property, the driveway, and the building orientation. And, and I'm even reading under Clearwater and the secondary street side. So, and this was brought to attention uh, by, one, by one resident. And so, to me, his, his situation, and then once I started looking at it, of course, I found all the nonconformities, people doing fences without permits, is that maybe it's in the identification of arterial and collector street. Because, go ahead, sorry. You're right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, because he's deep into the middle of a neighborhood, and it is an entrance to the neighborhood, but he's, as I recall, several blocks deep within the neighborhood, and there's not a line of sight issue with that particular corner as, as well as other corners. And I appreciate the fact that you said this is going to impact probably minimal residents. But with no remedy or consideration to, I, I just have some problems with that particular case. And then, and I thought the discussion would sort of come up with a, maybe some type of solution or additional recommendations for fixing all the nonconformities because this fellow has a problem, did not go get a permit and do it, whereas other folks just went ahead and did it, or they, they grew a hedge because we have no regulations and height of hedges, and then they put up a fence in the wrong place anyway. So, I mean, it was just through discovery that I seen all this, and... Uh, there, I mean, I would agree with you. There's probably a lot of unpermitted fences out there, but, you know, I, the amount of staff time that it would take to go out through the community, document, research. I'm not really sure what the benefit, you know, if there would be a substantial benefit to you for us to spend our time doing that. 
I mean, if council is inclined to allow six foot high fences on corner lots, my only suggestion would be require that it be an open type fence. I mean, I think, you know, fence regulations are complex. They're like sign regulations. Um, there's so many different lot configurations that you can have on a corner, you know, probably five to 10 different configurations you'll find throughout the city. And I mean, we have to balance, I think, people's needs for, you know, marking the boundary of their lot, which they can do with a four foot fence, protecting the children, which they can do with a four foot fence. I think the real question is um, whether somebody wants it just for privacy purposes or for their animals. Um, you know, I think one of our key concerns is maintaining an open feeling in our neighborhoods. I think sometimes when you get six foot high fences right along the street, you totally, you know, change the character of an area and a neighborhood. You also obstruct views of people that are walking and biking on the sidewalks as well as that of people from across the street. Um, and you prevent, you know, sort of eyes on the neighborhood when you start fencing in these corner lots with six foot high solid fences. So I guess my only recommendation would be if you want to allow a six foot high fence, I would certainly encourage you to make sure that it's an open like, design. Like chain link or? Um, coated chain link, like we allow coated chain link bl uh, black or green with landscaping, or you know maybe solid on the bottom but open on the top half of it, or like we allow in some of our other neighborhoods that are more high density in nature, just an open style fence, you know, like an aluminum that would have pickets that you could see through. Mm -hmm. Whether that would, you know, address this particular property owner's concern, I'm not sure, but that would be really my only recommendation if you wanted to change it. Mr. Warren? Yeah, Council, uh, I, uh, th there was a lot of discussion that we had uh, on this issue. Mm -hmm. And when Gina went back and looked at the meeting, you know, she came away from that, from from that, watching that video, you know, based on what she described, that you all wanted a little deeper uh, understanding of just, you know, what's the survey, you know, what 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 are other cities doing? Because it had been highlighted that some cities take a different approach. So, uh, and and you know, I, I sometimes I I trust my memory, sometimes I don't. So, I didn't see a reason to do a deeper dive you know, based on your expectation right. once she had reviewed the tape of the meeting that we were we were going to do what it was thought to mm -hmm. be what you all wanted um, and, uh, uh, and 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 I'll just reiterate it is difficult to get your arms around who's been grandfathered under the code you know to have various fences it is a challenge to address the whole issue of enforcement because we're a complaint driven uh, system uh, so I think where we are today is, you know, based on what's happening in other communities and the rationale behind it, you know, what's your passion for, you know, amending the code to accommodate a property owner who came, uh, came in to see us, he wants to accommodate his pet, and that's what was driving this from the very beginning. And I, we don't get many of those, you know, so to change the code, Strictly for that reason, uh, there has to be some other reasons why you, you 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 may want to do it. So that's why you know we're kind of here. So, but if you want to accommodate it, then then tell us to accommodate it, and we'll, um, and we'll move on. Ready to listen to my colleagues. Though. Clarify here because he can put a six foot fence up. He can. But it has to be in line with his house. And it has to have a hedge around it. If no. he puts it in line with his structure, he can put a six foot high fence. Okay. If he wants to have a four foot high fence, he can have one out pretty much to the street, I think the three, street, feet, yeah. three feet back from uh, the property line. So he has the option, he just would like to enclose a larger space on right. his lot than the right. house. Yeah, yeah, no, no I, I, he can go, right. there's a corner yeah. to the back, but yeah. he can't go right. from the I back mean, of the house out. And I think what we have to keep in mind is that whatever we do for this individual then applies to the entire mm -hmm. community. We can't just say, okay, you're special, you know, and we're going to let you do this. He has alternatives. He's just not happy with them, is the way I'm understanding what's been presented. 
Mr. Hamilton? Well, did you go yeah, well, I, All right, Mr. Well, I don't want to change the code for one person, but I've had complaints by other property owners uh, that wanted to have a security um, more than a four-foot fence. They wanted to have a six-foot for security purposes, and um, I and not solid PVC, but like an open fence, just something that it would be hard for a person to scale, that kind of thing. So why couldn't we, since we do have a flexible development code, make a flexibility there that um, six foot on the side if it is a an open style fence for security reasons? Is that something that would be too difficult to... What's there now? No, not six foot. Six. No, uh, that would have to be a, if, an amendment to the code. Well, what does this mean? Uh, on, on the sheet that you gave us, mm -hmm. it says on a primary street to six feet in other residential areas if open fence design and architecturally compatible. Oh, that's in our, um, not in our LMDR district. That is uh, for our high density Manager. residential areas. Scene. All right. Oh, six foot in LMDR, but uh, four foot in LMDR, but six foot in yeah, other yeah, residential areas. Yeah. Right. So oh, in a higher density area. Okay. Right. okay. Well, Gina actually did come back with a recommendation at the end of the presentation. Open fence, six foot. I think that's flexibility. It would answer not only the security yeah. question that you had, uh, or uh, concerns residents have had. I mean, everybody wouldn't take that option, but maybe somebody for security may, and it wouldn't enclose the neighborhood, which is your the planning department's beef, and I understand that. I don't want to see walls everywhere I go, but, uh, you know, something that... Well, and they can still do hedge and landscaping with well, the fence. But, but well, because what I, the way I look at that, though, is, okay, even if you put up a six-foot fence that's visible through a coated chain link or whatever, if you put, a, and, and you're putting it out for, for, then you put a hedge on the outside of that, now you're in, now you're restricting significantly. But they the they can lines. put a hedge right now. No, they can put a hedge out to like this particular fellow here. He could put a hedge out there and totally restrict I mean, you he, because there's no right regulation. Now put a four foot fence out to there and then put a hedge on the outside of that, which the hedge now becomes a visual <laughs> blockage of uh, of traffic. Right. We do not at this time regulate hedges. So, St. Petersburg I mean, it's, regulates yeah, you know, them. As hedge. you can see, I know Indian I mean, Rock Speech yeah. um, treats hedges as fences, so it is something that other communities do. But then again, you know, to enforce, I'm thinking from the code compliance side, um, that becomes challenging. Should we just leave it the way, it, because it, it is this one gentleman who is upset because of his pet. Well, and maybe some more folks are concerned about security. Well, but but from I've a had, different. Well, a different. It's a it's different. It's a different. But I've heard them complain that that you know this has been a a problem for them. So I I don't know if it's a if it's a they, I used to call it wrought iron, but they, it's aluminum now. If it's a wrought iron type, nice looking fence, I mean those are secure and it still gives you visibility through, they wanted to do that option, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I'll just leave it that way. Nor would I. Maybe should we should we take a show of hands who's interested in creating, how difficult is that to add that to, to amend the ordinance to allow six foot fence on, open fence on corner lots? I mean, I, it's not that difficult to, to write. I think we have language that we can model. But but but, but let, let's go back to Mr. Hamilton's point about then what do you do with the hedge? Do we allow or not allow the hedge? Because the idea is you want to because the see-through well, fence is no longer see-through if you put but, a hedge on the outside. Okay, so here's this will go back to my original point when we made this argument was what people are doing to avoid permitting and code right now. They're putting that hedge where they want it to exceed to extend way past, and then they put a fence up behind the hedge. So we don't regulate hedges. They could do that anyway, before or after a code amendment. That's like another, that's a whole nother. Well, then you got to start regulating. Now you, then you should start regulating hedges now because they're already putting hedges where they can't put fences. 
Let, let us let us kind of work through the unintended consequence of, of doing what you all okay. You okay. Know, agree, and then uh, and then we'll if, if we run into a nuance that needs to be brought back to you, we'll bring it back to you. But okay. Otherwise, Thank you. I think we understand what you're doing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Gene. Thirteen point three, Mr. Hamilton. Okay. Let me start. I'm going to start this by saying, and I think I can speak for everybody that you know. My heart goes out to anyone who has lost a family member or a loved one to uh, you know, any aspect of Kratom um, or you know, belief that Kratom was, was a contributing factor to the, the loss of the loved one. But I'm saying that we as a city are doing it makes no difference for us as a city to take a position pro, con, against, or ban it, allow it, whatever, as a city when you take into consideration Pinellas County has 26 other municipalities. If we take a position, say, hypothetically, that we ban it, but Dunedin, Safety Harbor, and Largo don't, it's still readily accessible. It's readily accessible on the Internet. It's, um, it, it just, this is an issue that, you know, the, the, chemical, the chemical characteristics of it, the, the human, uh, the effects it has on the human body, uh, these are things that need to be studied by federal grant money or whatever. Um, and for continuity of law enforcement, this is, this is something that needs to be decided, and if it's going to be legislated, it needs to be legislated at the state level for, as a minimum or even the federal level. Because, again, at the county level, Pinellas County takes a position against it. Well, if Hillsborough and Pasco don't, you cross a bridge, you cross a county line, and it's still available. So for us to even take up staff time, I, my suggestion is to tell staff we don't need to take a position. We don't need to do this. It's not our job to do this research. Uh, we have other things that to do. This is not in our wheelhouse. This is not something we need to take a position on in any way, shape, or form. This needs to be handled at either the state or federal level. That's my opinion, and I'm looking to see if I get consensus of this to direct staff that we don't need to be addressing Kratom from this point forward. That needs to be someone else, you know, that's different agency's job. Mr. Albright. I agree. Uh, Mr. I, Condo. I would agree, too. We don't need laws against things that are now legal. Take that three. Okay. Uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Hamilton, mm -hmm. but I am a little disappointed because one of the things that we told the public that was here was that we would give them notice if we were going to be discussing this again. And I had no idea when I saw this on the agenda, and I felt like I had a responsibility because the public that was here, I had told them that if they would limit their comments, that I would make sure that they knew that we were having another discussion before, you know, so that they wouldn't be blindsided. Because the one thing that we all objected to was the fact that they all came thinking that it was on our agenda because someone had put the word out on the internet. Uh, I'm also a little disappointed because now you're asking us to take a position that I don't disagree with, but it's also telling the state, you know, you control it when one of the arguments that we continually make is that we want home rule. And, and, and while the situation is a little different, okay, there are similar similarities on, on, on other issues that may not be health related, but are related from a short term rental position, you know. So I would have preferred that we just let staff do what it was doing and it was going to come back to us with with nothing. And that would have been the end of the conversation. Well, and my um, position is my position is staff does need to be taking their time to do this because this is not an issue we need to take a position on. This is something that needs to be addressed at a higher level. And I apologize for, you know, you 
you know having to send out all those extra e mails and i got responses on a number of them over the weekend it but it, it was you know i just felt like you know our staff has other things to focus on rather than something that us taking a position one way or the other has zero impact unless everybody else around us takes the exact same position but, so but, it, but it's there just, are there are those other cities that have taken a position on the issue well and and, and I, so i know of one yeah. i know of one um, and so so what do you want us to do you want us to have an official vote saying that we don't want staff i don't think we even need a vote i think we just need a consensus of the council to say staff you, you don't need to Mr. worry Horn, about where this. was this on the staff level i mean i i i, I didn't even realize Pam, uh, Pam had, uh, I think it was Matt Smith was working with, uh, wasn't, yeah, Matt Smith was doing the research on it and in consultation with uh, police. I know there is so some that's, legislation. That's where the research was I know there's legislation either being introduced or, or on the docket um, or at the state level in the upcoming session. Right. Um, and I think they're the people at the minimum, the state level is where it needs to be decided. Not by not by any any you know local. All I can tell you is that uh, legally, council certainly has the authority. So that's that's pretty much been the extent of my research. I know that the um, narcotics division has been looking into it, but uh, I don't have any information on that. Chief. So our chief of police um, our research is pretty much to the point where we've concluded our research we were getting close to necessarily pre presenting it to you uh, kind of the order of operations was we were looking at it from an issue and then Matt would look at it from the regulation standpoint and develop any potential if we felt um, you know Kratom uh, it kind of popped up on our radar about two years ago it started showing up more in DUI cases than anything else um, there's about 20 26 stores in Clearwater that, that use Kratom I think uh, you've been sh a lot of information has already been shared to you about where it is, its origin, and kind of its uses. In low doses, it's kind of a uh, stimulant, but in higher doses, it becomes more of a sedative. And um, and in uh, in frequent, repeated uses, it can be somewhat addicting. We haven't had a significant um, relationship with death cases. Um, it has come up in two death investigations. One of them involved an elderly person who had a uh, numerous different uh, physical ailments and. Um, had abused it, had obtained it online through a place in Oregon, and, uh, and that person had been attributed to that overdose or that overuse of that particular product um, was attributed to her death. The other incident involved a, uh, a suicide um, uh, back in 2018, and uh, that person had been suffering delusions his entire life, and I would say that the kratom was more of a, um, a treatment for the person trying to treat his delusions than it was the result of, of the suicide, so it was just mentioned in the report. Um, of our review of kind of the, the national stage about a death investigations, um, you know, the, the 80 to 90 percent of them involve other narcotics, other drugs. It's a multi-drug toxic toxicity issue with these involvement, and it's not, um, you know, a singular cause of, uh, of deaths. Um, the, uh, there is a concern that uh, I had expressed to the manager in the past about if we were to regulate it in Clearwater, uh, the readily available availability of it online, which is probably more of the threat than even your neighboring jurisdictions, because I, I would suspect that the, the influx of, of usage is coming. Of, all, of the contacts we've had, it's generally been from online suppliers. Um, you'll probably find even your local people will claim that they have a better quality control and that the, the uses of the products that are coming through online resources, I would not suggest you use any bootleg, pro, bootleg product you get from China. That's just bad advice. And that stuff is coming in through the internet on a regular occasion, both at the fentanyl level, the, the opiate levels, and you know, the crowd. Um, so, you know, our, our recommendation right now is that we don't believe there's a, a need to regulate it. Um, and I discussed with you about meeting with you uh, in the future, but uh, this is and more than happy to answer any questions of very specific about the product or issue. Mr. Albright. And to your comment, I don't think the people that filled this room last week will be disappointed with it. No, I, no. but, but, but my, my thinking is just let it ride. Well, yeah. that's why I say, I mean, if you want, if you, if you, if you want to still let it be on a, on a you know, Thursday night meeting as an agenda item, I, 
I can. I would make the motion at that meeting. Uh, I would make the motion at that meeting that we do nothing because I think that's where 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 our position should be. It needs to be. This needs to be governed or legislated at a higher level than the city of Clearwater. I, I think we've just heard the, the, the city's you know, staff recommendations. And okay. I, I, unless somebody wants to 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 uh, regulate it, I don't know that we need to do anything further. And, and okay. that was that was where I thought we were leaving all of this because there's no you know. And now hopefully the well the press is not in the room, but hopefully they're watching and yeah. uh, they yeah. will. Let it be known that, oh, he is yeah. here. Okay. okay. So, um, and, 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 and the story in the paper was right on. It said that we weren't really going to do anything. That's why I was, again, surprised by why we're putting it on the agenda. Because, you know. Well, it, I, that was my thing. Yeah. I wanted to just put it to bed and be done with it because I don't think we have any business legislating it. Well, so. But anyway. All right. We're finished with that. Well, Mayor, sure. I would just say so. You know, obviously, you could have someone Thursday night. Mm -hmm. It right. won't be on the agenda, right. so that they could come up. And, right. And if you, I, I think yeah. you just close it out. Yeah. You know, based on. I, I thought it was closed until it showed up on the agenda again. So anyway, uh, unless there's any further business, we are adjourned. <laughs>